Chapter 5 The Perfect Temple Although the Greeks borrowed many ideas from Egypt and Mesopotamia, they quickly developed an independent artistic identity. Their many innovations in painting, sculpture, and architecture became the foundation of the Western tradition. Indeed, no building type has ever had a longer and more profound impact on the later history of architecture than the Greek temple, which was itself a multimedia monument, richly adorned with painted statues and reliefs. The greatest Greek temple was the Parthenon, Fig 5-1, erected on the Acropolis of Athens in the mid-5th century BCE. It represents the culmination of a century-long effort by Greek architects to build a temple having perfect proportions. Consistent with the thinking of the influential philosopher Pythagoras of Samos, who believed that beauty resided in harmonic numerical ratios, the architect Ictinos calculated the dimensions of every part of the Parthenon in terms of a fixed proportional scheme. Thus, the ratio of the length to the width of the building, the number of columns on the long versus the short sides. Even the relationship between the diameter of a column and the space between neighboring columns conformed to an all-encompassing mathematical formula. The result was a perfect temple. The Athenians did not, however, construct the Parthenon to solve a purely formal problem of architectural design. Nor was this perfect temple, dedicated to Athena Prothenus, the Virgin, a shrine honoring the goddess alone. The temple also celebrated the Athenian people, who a generation earlier had led the Greeks in their successful effort to defeat the Persians after they had sacked the Acropolis in 480 BCE. Under the direction of Phidias, a team of gift-ed sculptors lavishly decorated the building with statues and reliefs that in many cases alluded to the victory over the Persians. For example, the sculptural program included a series of reliefs depicting nude Greek warriors battling with the part horse part human centaurs an allegory of the triumph of civilization that is, Greek civilization, over barbarism, in this case, the Persians. The statues in one of the pediments, the triangular area above the columns beneath the roof, told the story of the birth of Athena, who emerged from the head of her father Zeus, king of the gods, fully armed and ready to protect her people. The costliest sculpture. And most prestigious of all, however, Phidias reserved for himself the colossal gold and ivory statue of Athena inside the temple in which the warrior goddess presented the Athenians with the winged personify Cation of victory and unmistakable reference to the Greek victory over the Persians. The Greeks and their gods. Ancient Greek art occupies a special place in the history of art through the ages. Many of the cultural values of the Greeks, especially the exaltation of humanity as the measure of all things, remain today fundamental tenets of Western civilization. This humanistic worldview led the Greeks to create the concept of democracy, ruled by the demos, the people, and to make groundbreaking contributions in the fields of art, literature, and science. Ancient Greek ideas are so completely part of modern Western habits of mind that most people are scarcely aware the concepts originated in Greece 2,500 years ago. The Greeks, or Hellenes, as they called themselves, were the product of an intermingling of Aegean and Indo-European peoples who established independent city-states, or polis, singular, polis. The Dorians of the north, who many believe brought an end to Mycenaean civilization, settled in the Peloponnesus, map 5 to 1. The Ionians settled the western coast of Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and the islands of the Aegean Sea, possibly because the northern invaders forced them out of Greece. But the Ionians may have been native to Asia Minor, developing out of a mixed stock of settlers between the 11th and 8th centuries BCE. Whatever the origins of the various regional populations, in 776 BCE the separate Greek-speaking states held their FERST athletic games in common at Olympia. From then on, despite their differences and rivalries, the Greeks regarded themselves as citizens of Hellas, distinct from the surrounding barbarians who did not speak Greek. Even the gods of the Greeks, see the gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus, page 107, 
differed in kind from those of neighboring civilizations. Unlike Egyptian and Mesopotamian deities, the Greek gods and goddesses differed from human beings only in being immortal. The Greeks made their gods into humans and their humans into gods. The perfect individual became the Greek ideal and the portrayal of beautiful humans became the focus of many of the greatest Greek artists. The sculptures, paintings, and buildings discussed in this chapter come from cities all over Greece and their many colonies abroad, map 5 to 1, but Athens, where the plays of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides were FERST performed, and where many of the most famous artists and architects worked, has justifiably become the symbol of ancient Greek culture. Thr, Socrates engaged his fellow citizens in philosophical argument, and Plato formulated his prescription for the ideal form of government in his Republic. Complementing the rich intellectual life of Athens was a strong interest in athletic exercise. The Athenian aim of achieving a balance of intellectual and physical discipline, an ideal of humanistic education, is well expressed in the familiar phrase a sound mind in a sound body. The distinctiveness and originality of Greek contributions to art, science, and politics should not, however, obscure the enormous debt the Greeks owed to the cultures of Egypt and Mesopotamia. The ancient Greeks themselves readily acknowledged borrowing ideas, motifs, conventions, and skills from those older civilizations. Nor should a high estimation of Greek art and culture blind anyone to the realities of Hellenic life and society. Even Athenian democracy was a political reality for only one segment of the demos. Slavery was a universal institution among the Greeks, and Greek women were in no way the equals of Greek men. Women normally remained secluded in their homes, emerging usually only for weddings, funerals, and religious festivals. They played little part in public or political life. Despite the fame of the poet Sappho, only a handful of female artists' names are known. And none of their works survive. The existence of slavery and the exclusion of women from public life are both reflection ect in Greek art. Freeborn men and women often appear with their slaves in monumental sculpture. The Symposium, a dinner party only men and prostitutes attended, is a popular subject on painted vases. Geometricand. Orientalizing periods. The destruction of the Mycenaean palaces brought with it the disintegration of the Bronze Age social order. The disappearance of powerful kings and their retinues led to the loss of the knowledge of how to cut masonry, to construct citadels and tombs, to paint frescoes, and to sculpt in stone. Depopulation, poverty, and an almost total loss of contact with the outside world characterized the succeeding centuries. Sometimes called the Dark Age of Greece. Only in the 8th century BCE did economic conditions improve and the population begin to grow again. Th's era was in its own way a heroic age, when the Greeks established the Olympic Games and wrote down Homer's epic poems, formerly passed orally from bard to bard. During the 8th century BCE, the Greeks broke free of their isolation and once again began to trade with cities in both the East and the West. Geometric Art the 8th century also brought the return of the human figure to Greek art not in monumental statuary, which was exceedingly rare even in Bronze Age Greece, but in small bronze figurines and in paintings on ceramic pots. Dipylon Crater One of the earliest examples of Greek figure painting is a huge crater, Fig 5-2, that marked the grave of a man buried around 740 BCE in the Dipylon Cemetery of Athens. At well over 3 feet tall, this vase is a considerable technical achievement and a testament both to the potter's skill and to the wealth and position of the deceased's family in the community. The bottom of the great vessel is open, perhaps to permit visitors to the grave to pour libations in honor of the dead, perhaps simply to provide a drain for rainwater, or both. The artist covered much of the crater's surface with precisely painted abstract angular motifs in horizontal bands. Especially prominent is the meander, or key pattern around the rim of the crater. The decoration of most early Greek vases consists exclusively of abstract motifs hence the designation of this formative phase of Greek art as the geometric period. On this crater, however, 
geometric ornament does not dominate. Instead, the painter reserved the widest part of the vase for two bands of human effigies and horse-drawn chariots rather than for geometric ornament. Befitting the vase's function, the scenes depict the mourning for a man laid out on his bier and the grand chariot procession in his honor, scenes that appear frequently on other large geometric vessels that served as grave markers, for example, the name piece of the Dipylon painter. A five-foot-tall vase, Fig 5, 2A, that also stood in the Dipylon cemetery. The painter of the crater Fell'd every empty space around the Fegers with circles and M-shaped ornaments, negating any sense that the mourners or soldiers inhabit open space. The human figures, animals, and furniture are as two-dimensional as the geometric shapes elsewhere on the vessel. In the upper band, the shroud, raised to reveal the corpse, is an abstract checkerboard-like backdrop. The figures are silhouettes constructed of triangular, frontal, torsos with attached profi le arms, legs, and heads, with a single large frontal eye in the center, following the age-old convention. To distinguish male from female, the painter added a penis growing out of one of the deceased's thighs. The mourning women, who tear their hair out in grief, have breasts emerging beneath their armpits. In both cases the artist's concern was specifying gender, not anatomical accuracy. Below, the warriors look like walking shields and, in the old conceptual manner, the two wheels of the chariots appear side by side. The horses have the correct number of heads and legs but seem to share a common body, so that there is no sense of overlapping or depth. Despite the highly stylized and conventional manner of representation, Vessels like this one and the Dipylon painter's funerary vase, Fig 5, 2A, mark a significant turning point in the history of Greek art. Not only did the human figure re-enter the painter's repertoire, but the geometric artists also revived the art of storytelling in pictures. Heracles and Nessos One of the most impressive surviving geometric sculptures is a characteristically small solid cast bronze group, Fig 5-3 made up of two schematic figures locked in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle. The man is a hero, probably Heracles, see Heracles, page 128. His opponent is a centaur, possibly Nessos, who had volunteered to carry the hero's bride across a river and then assaulted her. Whether or not the hero is Heracles and the centaur is Nessos, the mythological nature of the group is certain. The repertoire of the geometric artist was not limited to scenes inspired by daily life, and death. Composite monsters were enormously popular in Mesopotamia and Egypt, and renewed contact with foreign cultures may have inspired the human-animal monsters of geometric Greece. The centaur, however, is a purely Greek invention and one that posed a problem for the artist, who had, of course, never seen such a creature. The geometric artist conceived the centaur as a man in front and a horse in back, a rather unhappy and unconvincing configuration in which the forelegs and hind legs belong to different species. In this example, the sculptor rendered the figure of the hero and the human part of the centaur in a similar fashion. Both have beards and wear helmets. But, contradictory to nature, the man is larger than the horse to indicate that he will be the victor. Like other geometric male figures, both painted and sculpted, this hero is nude, in contrast to the Mesopotamian statuettes that might have inspired the Greek works. Here, at the very beginning of Greek figural art, the Hellenic instinct for the natural beauty of the human figure is evident. Greek athletes exercised without their clothes and even competed nude in the Olympic Games from very early times. Orientalizing Art during the 7th century BCE, the pace and scope of Greek trade and colonization accelerated and Greek artists became exposed more than ever before to Eastern artworks, especially small portable objects such as Syrian ivory carvings. The closer contact had a profound effect on the development of Greek art. Indeed, so many motifs borrowed from or inspired by Egyptian and Mesopotamian art entered the Greek pictorial vocabulary at this time that art historians have dubbed the 7th century BCE the Orientalizing Period. Mantiklos Apollo One of the masterworks of the early 7th century BCE is the Mantiklos Apollo, Fig 5-4, to 
a small bronze statuette dedicated to Apollo by an otherwise unknown man named Manticlos. Scratched into the thighs of the figure is a message to the deity, Manticlos dedicated me as a tithe to the far-shooting lord of the Silver Bow, you. Phoebos Apollo, might give some pleasing favor in return. Because the Greeks conceived their gods in human form, it is uncertain whether the figure represents the youthful Apollo or Manticlos, or neither. But if the left hand at one time held a bow, the statuette is certainly an image of the deity. In any case, the purpose of the votive offering is clear. Equally apparent is the increased interest Greek artists at this time had in reproducing details of human anatomy, such as the long hair framing the unnaturally elongated neck, and the pectoral and abdominal muscles, which define the stylized triangular torso. The triangular face once had inlaid eyes, and the figure may have worn a separately fashioned helmet. O-R-I-E-N-T-A-L-I-Z-I-N-G Amphora and Elaborate Corinthian Amphora, Fig 5 to 5, or Two-Handled Storage Jar, typify E.S. the new Greek fascination with the Orient. In a series of bands recalling the organization of geometric painted vases, animals such as the native boar appear beside exotic lions and panthers and composite creatures inspired by eastern monsters such as the Sphinx and Lamassu in this instance the siren, part bird, part woman, prominently displayed on the amphora's neck. The white appeal of these vases was due not solely to their orientalizing animal friezes but also to a new ceramic technique the Corinthians invented. Art historians call this type of vase decoration black figure painting, see Greek vase painting, page 110. The black figure painter Frst put down black silhouettes on the clay surface, as in geometric times, but then used a sharp pointed instrument to incise linear details within the forms, usually adding highlights in white or purplish red over the black figures before firing the vase. The combination of the weighty black silhouettes with the delicate detailing and the bright polychrome overlay proved to be irresistible, and Athenian painters soon copied the technique the Corinthians pioneered. Daedalic Art The founding of the Greek trading colony of Nocritus in Egypt, map 3 to 1, before 630 BCE brought the Greeks into direct contact with the monumental stone architecture of the Egyptians. Soon after ER, Greek builders began to erect the Frst stone edifice CES since the fall of the Mycenaean kingdoms. One of the oldest is Temple A, Fig 5, 6A, at Prinias on Crete. Th at Island, once the center of Minoan civilization, see Chapter 4, is probably also where an early Greek sculptor carved the limestone statuette of a goddess or maiden, Kore, plural, Kore, popularly known as the Lady of Oxer. Fig 5 to 6, aft er the French town that is her oldest recorded location. The Lady of Oxer is the masterpiece of the style usually referred to as Didalic, after the legendary artist Daedalus, whose name means the skillful one. In addition to his status as a great sculptor, Daedalus reputedly built the labyrinth in Crete to house the Minotaur and also designed a temple at Memphis in Egypt. The historical Greeks attributed to him almost all the great achievements in early sculpture and architecture. As with the figure Manticlos dedicated, Fig 5 to 4, it is uncertain whether the Oxer lady is a mortal or a deity. She is clothed, as are all Greek goddesses and women of this period, but she does not wear a head dress, as do the contemporaneous goddesses, Fig 5, 6b, of Temple A at Prinias. Moreover, the placement of the right hand across the chest is probably a gesture of prayer, also indicating that this is a coret. The style is much more naturalistic than in geometric times, but the love of abstract shapes is still evident. Note, for example, the triangular Florida at topped head framed by long strands of hair that form triangles complementary to the shape of the face, and the decoration of the long skirt with its incised concentric squares, once brightly painted as were all Greek stone statues. The modern notion that Greco-Roman statuary was pure white is mistaken. The Greeks did not, however, color their statues garishly. They left the flesh in the natural color of the stone, which they waxed and polished, and painted the eyes, lips, hair, and drapery in encaustic, 
CIAIA of Sisychus and the Art of Encaustic Painting, Chapter 7, page 218, and Fig 5, 63a. In this technique, the painter mixed the pigment with hot wax and applied it to the statue to produce a durable coloration. Archaic Period The legend that Daedalus worked in Egypt reflects the enormous influence of Egyptian art and architecture on the Greeks not only during the Orientalizing Age of the 7th century BCE but also in the succeeding Archaic Period, which lasted from 600 to 480 BCE. Statuary According to the FERST century BCE Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, Daedalus used the same compositional patterns for his statues as the Egyptians used for their own. The earliest surviving truly monumental stone statues of the Greeks do, in fact, follow very closely the standard Egyptian format. New York Kouros One of the earliest Greek examples of life-size statuary, Fig 5-7, is the marble Kouros, youth, plural. Kouroi, now in New York which emulates the stance of Egyptian statues, Fig 3-12. In both Egypt and Greece, the Fegur is rigidly frontal with the left foot advanced slightly. The arms are held beside the body, and the Fe streets are clenched with the thumbs forward. Like most Egyptian statues, the New York Kouros was a funerary statue. It stood over a grave in the countryside of Attica, the region around Athens. Statues such as this one replaced the huge vases, figs 5 to 2 and 5, 2a, of geometric times as the preferred form of grave marker in the 6th century BCE. The Greeks also used kouroi as votive offerings in sanctuaries. The kouros type, because of its generic quality, could be employed in several different contexts. Despite the adherence to Egyptian prototypes, Greek Kouros statues differ from their models in two important ways. First, the Greek sculptors liberated the Ephigers from the stone block. The Egyptian obsession with permanence was alien to the Greeks, who were preoccupied with Fendeing ways to represent motion rather than stability in their sculpted Ephigers. Second, the Kouroi are nude, and in the absence of identifying attributes, they, like Mantiklos's bronze statuette, Fig 5 to 4, are formally indistinguishable from Greek images of deities with their perfect bodies exposed for all to see. The New York Kouros shares many traits with the Mantiklos Apollo and other orientalizing works such as the Lady of Oxer. Especially the triangular shape of head and hair and the flatness of the face, the hallmarks of the Daedalic style. Eyes, nose, and mouth all sit on the front of the head, and the ears on the sides. The long hair forms a florida at backdrop behind the head. The placement of the various anatomical parts is the result of the sculptors having drawn these features on four independent sides of the marble block. Following the same workshop procedure used in Egypt for millennia. The New York Kouros also has the slim waist of earlier Greek statues and exhibits the same love of pattern. The pointed arch of the rib cage, for example, echoes the V-shaped ridge of the hips, which suggests but does not accurately reproduce the rounded flesh and muscle of the human body. Calf bearer a generation later than the New York Kouros is the statue of a Moscow Foros, fig 5-8, or calf bearer, found in fragments on the Athenian Acropolis. Its inscribed base, not visible in the photograph, states that a man named Ron Bose dedicated the statue to Athena in thanksgiving for his prosperity. Ron Bose is almost certainly the calf-bearer himself, bringing an offering to the goddess. He stands in the left, foot-forward manner of the Kuroi, but he is bearded and therefore no longer a youth. He wears a thin cloak, once painted to set it off from the otherwise nude body. No one dressed in this way in ancient Athens. The sculptor adhered to the artistic convention of male nudity and attributed to the calf-bearer the noble perfection nudity imparts but nevertheless indicated that this mature gentleman is clothed, as any respectable citizen would be in this context. The archaic sculptor's love of pattern is evident once again in the handling of the difficult problem of representing man and animal together. The calf's legs and the Moscow Foros's arms form a bold X that unites the two bodies both physically and formally. The calf bearers face diff ers markedly from those of earlier Greek statues, and those of Egypt and Mesopotamia, 
in one notable way. The man smiles or at least seems to. From this time on, archaic Greek statues always smile, even in the most inappropriate contexts, see, for example, Fig 5-27, where a dying warrior with an arrow in his chest grins broadly. Art historians have interpreted this so-called archaic smile in various ways, but the smile should not be taken literally. Rather, the archaic smile seems to be the sculptor's way of indicating that the person portrayed is alive. By adopting this convention, Greek artists signaled a very different intention from their Egyptian counterparts. Anavysos Kouros Sometime around 530 BCE, a young man named Kouros died a hero's death in battle, and his family erected a Kouros statue, Fig 5-9, over his grave at Anabasis, not far from Athens. Fortunately, some of the paint remains, giving a better sense of the statue's original appearance. The inscribed base invites visitors to stay and mourn at the tomb of dead Kouros, whom raging Ares destroyed one day as he fought in the foremost ranks. The smiling statue is no more a portrait of a specific youth than is the New York Kouros. But two generations later, without rejecting the Egyptian stance, the Greek sculptor rendered the human body in a far more naturalistic manner. The head is no longer too large for the body, and the face is more rounded, with swelling cheeks replacing the Florida at planes of the earlier work. The long hair does not form a stiff backdrop to the head but falls naturally over the back. The V-shaped ridges of the New York Kouros have become rounded, fleshy hips. Peplos Kouros a stylistic sister to the Anabasis Kouros is the statue of a woman traditionally known as the Peplos Kouros, Fig 5-10, because until recently scholars thought this Kouros wore a Peplos. A Peplos is a simple, long, woolen belted garment. Careful examination of the statue has revealed, however, that she wears four different garments, one of which only goddesses wore. The attribute the goddess held in her missing left hand would immediately have identified her. Whichever goddess she is, the contrast with the Lady of Oxer, Fig 5-6, is striking. Although in both cases the drapery conceals the entire body save for head, arms, and feet the 6th century BCE sculptor rendered the soft female form much more naturally. This soft ER treatment of the Florida Esh also sharply differentiates later Kore from Kuroi, which have hard, muscular bodies. Traces of paint remain on the Peplus Kore because the statue lay buried for more than two millennia, which protected the painted surface from the destructive EFFECTs of exposure to the atmosphere and bad weather. The Persians had knocked over this statue, Ronboses, Fig 5-8, and many other votive offerings in Athena's sanctuary during their sack of the Acropolis in 480 BCE. Shortly thereafter, er, the Athenians buried all the damaged archaic sculptures, which accounts for the preservation of the coloration today. Kora in Ionian dress by the late 6th century BCE. The light linen Ionian chiton, worn in conjunction with a heavier Himadion, mantle, was the garment of choice for fashionable women. Archaic sculptors of Kore in Ionian dress, Fig 5-11, delighted in rendering the intricate patterns created by the cascading folds of thin, soft material. The asymmetry of the folds greatly relieves the stiff frontality of the body and makes the figure appear much more lifelike than the typical kouros. The sculptor achieved added variety by showing the Kore grasping part of her chiton in her left hand, unfortunately broken off, to lift it off the ground in order to take a step forward. Th's is the equivalent of the advanced left foot of the Kuroi and became standard for statues of Kore. Despite the varied surface treatment of brightly colored garments on the Kore, the Kore postures are as fexed as those of their male counterparts. Architecture and Architectural Sculpture The earliest Greek temples do not survive because their builders constructed them of wood and mud brick. Pausanias noted in his 2nd century CE guidebook to Greece that in the even ancient temple of Hera at Olympia, one oak column was still in place. Stone columns had replaced the others. For archaic and later Greek temples, however, Greek builders used more permanent materials limestone or, where it was available, marble, which was more impressive and durable, 
and more expensive. In Greece proper, if not in its western colonies, marble was readily at hand. Bluish-white marble came from Mount Hymettus, just east of Athens. And glittering white marble from Mount Pentelicus, northeast of the city, and from the Aegean Islands, especially Paros. Already in the orientalizing 7th century BCE, at Prinias, the Greeks had built a stone temple, Fig 5, 6a, embellished with stone sculptures, but the Cretan temple resembled the Megaron of a Mycenaean palace more than anything Greek traders had seen in their travels overseas. In the Archaic Age of the 6th century BCE, with the model of Egyptian columnar halls such as those at Luxor, Fig 3, 24a, and Karnak, Figs 3-25 and 3-26, before them, Greek architects began to build the columnar stone temples that have become synonymous with Greek architecture and inflammable against countless later structures in the Western world. The canonical Greek temple Greek temples differed in function from most later religious shrines. The altar lay outside the temple at the east end, facing the rising sun and the Greeks gathered outside, not inside, the building to worship. The temple proper housed the so-called cult statue of the deity, the grandest of all votive offerings, both in its early and mature manifestations. The Greek temple was the house of the god or goddess, not of his or her followers. In basic plan, see Greek tell of plans, above, and fig 5 to 12. The Greek temple still discloses a close affinity with the Mycenaean Megaron, fig 4 to 18 and even in its most elaborate form, it retains the Megaron's basic simplicity. In all cases, the remarkable order, compactness, and symmetry of the Greek scheme strike the eye first. Reflection ECTing the Greeks' sense of proportion and their EFF or to achieve ideal forms in terms of regular numerical relationships and geometric rules, CTHE Perfect Temple, page 105. Figural sculpture played a major role in the exterior program of the Greek temple from early times, partly to embellish the god's shrine, partly to tell something about the deity represented within, and partly to serve as a votive offering. But Greek architects also conceived the building itself, with its F.E. northeastly carved capitals and moldings, as sculpture, abstract in form and possessing the power of sculpture to evoke human responses. To underscore the commanding importance of the sculptured temple and its inspiring function in public life, the Greeks usually erected their temples on elevated sites, often on a hill above the city, Acropolis means high city. Most of the sculptural ornament was on the upper part of the building, in the frieze and pediments, see Doric and Ionic orders. Page 116. The Greeks painted their architectural sculptures, Fig 5-26. As they did their freestanding statues, and usually placed sculpture only in the building parts that had no structural function. Th is as true particularly of the Doric order, Fig 5 to 13, left, in which decorative sculpture appears only in the voids of the metopes and pediments. Ionic, Fig 5 to 13, right, builders were willing to decorate the entire frieze and sometimes even the lower column drums. Occasionally, Ionic architects replaced columns with female F figures, caryatids. Figs 5 to 17 and 5 to 54. Designers also painted capitals, decorative moldings, and other architectural elements, which enabled architects to bring out more clearly the relationships of the structural parts and soft E and the stones glitter at specify C points, as well as provide a background to set off the figures. Although the Greeks used color for emphasis and to relieve what might have seemed too bare, Greek architecture primarily depended on clarity and balance. To the Greeks, it was unthinkable to use surfaces in the way the Egyptians used their gigantic columns as FELs for complicated ornamentation, Fig 3-25. The history of Greek temple architecture is the history of Greek architects' unflagging efforts to find the most satisfactory, that is, what they believed were perfect proportions for each part of the building and for the structure as a whole. Basilica, Pistum The premier example of early Greek efforts at Doric temple design is not in Greece but in Italy, south of Naples, at Pistum, Greek Poseidonia. The huge, 80 by 170 feet, 
archaic temple, Fig 5 to 14, erected there around 550 BCE retains its entire peripteral colonnade, but most of the entablature, including the frieze, pediment, and all of the roof, has vanished. Called the Basilica aft er the Roman columnar hall building type, see Chapter 7, that early investigators felt it resembled, the structure was a shrine to the goddess Hera known as the Temple of Hera I to distinguish it from its neighbor, the later Temple of Hera II, Fig 5-29. The misnomer is partly due to the building's plan, Fig 5-15, which differs from that of most other Greek temples. The unusual feature Found only in early archaic temples, is the central row of columns dividing the cella into two aisles. Placing columns underneath the ridgepole, the timber beam running the length of the building below the peak of the gabled roof, might seem the logical way to provide interior support for the roof structure, but it had several disadvantages. The cella columns allowed no place for a central cult statue. Further, in order to correspond with the interior, the temple's facade required an odd number of columns, nine in this case. At Pistum, there are also three columns in Antis instead of the standard two, which in turn ruled out a central doorway for viewing the statue. This design, however, was well suited for two statues, perhaps of Zeus and Hera. In any case, the architect still achieved a simple one, two ratio of facade and Florida ank columns by placing 18 columns on each side of the temple. Another early aspect of the Pistum temple is the shape of its heavy, closely spaced columns, Fig 5 to 14, with their large, bulky, pancake-like Doric capitals, which seem compressed by the overbearing weight of what probably was a high, massive entablature. The columns have a pronounced swelling, in tassis, at the middle of the shafts, giving them a profile akin to that of a cigar. The columns and capitals thus express in a vivid manner their weight-bearing function. One structural reason, perhaps, for the heaviness of the design and the narrowness of the spans between the columns might be that the archaic builders were afraid thinner and more widely spaced columns would result in the superstructure's collapse. In later Doric temples, figs 5 to 1, 5 to 24, 5 to 29, and 5 to 44, the builders placed the columns farther apart and refined the forms. The shaft S became more slender. The intasis subtler, the capitals smaller and the entablature lighter. Greek architects sought the ideal proportional relationship among the parts of their buildings. The sculptors of archaic Kuroi and Kore grappled with similar problems. Architecture and sculpture developed in a parallel manner in the 6th century BCE. Temple of Artemis, Corfu in fact, architects and sculptors frequently worked together, as at Corfu, ancient Corsera. Where? Soon after ER 600 BCE, the Greeks constructed a large Doric temple in honor of Artemis. Corfu is an island off the western coast of Greece and was an important stop on the trade route between the mainland and the Greek settlements in Italy, map 5 to 1. Prosperity made possible one of the earliest stone peripteral temples in Greece, one also lavishly embellished with sculpture. Sculptors decorated the metopes with reliefs, unfortunately very fragmentary today and fell both pediments with huge high-relief sculptures, more than nine feet high at the center. It appears the pediments on both ends of the temple were decorated in an identical manner. The west pediment, fig 5 to 16, is better preserved. Designing fe girl decoration for a pediment was never an easy task for the Greek sculptor because of the pediment's awkward triangular shape. The central fe girls had to be of great size. In contrast, as the pediment tapered toward the corners, the available area became increasingly cramped. At the center of the Corfu pediment is the Gorgon Medusa, a demon with a woman's body and a bird's wings. Medusa also had a hideous face and snake hair, and anyone who gazed at her turned into stone. The Corfu sculptor depicted her in the conventional archaic bent leg, bent arm, pinwheel-like posture that signify es running or, for a winged creature, flying. To her left and right are two great felines. Together they serve as temple guardians, repulsing all enemies from the sanctuary of the goddess. Similar panthers stood sentinel on the lintel, fig 5, 
6b, of the 7th century BCE temple at Prinias. The Corfu felines are in the tradition of the guardian lions of Mycenae, fig 4 to 19, and the beasts that stood guard at the entrances to Hittite and Assyrian palaces, figs 2, 18b and 2 to 20. Medusa herself is also an apotropaic figure that protects the temple and wards off evil spirits. The triad of Medusa and the felines recalls as well Mesopotamian heraldic human and animal compositions, fig 2 to 10. The Corfu figures are, in short, still further examples of the orientalizing manner in early Greek sculpture. Between Medusa and the two felines are two smaller figures the human Chrysaor at her left and the winged horse Pegasus at her right, only the rear legs remain, next to Medusa's right foot. Chrysaor and Pegasus were Medusa's children. According to legend, they sprang from her head when the Greek hero Perseus severed it with his sword. Their presence here on either side of the living Medusa is therefore a chronological impossibility. The archaic artist was not interested in telling a coherent story but in identifying the central figure by depicting her offspring. Narration was, however, the purpose of the much smaller groups situated in the pediment corners. To the viewer's right is Zeus, brandishing his thunderbolt and slaying a kneeling giant. In the extreme corner, not preserved, was a dead giant. The Gigantomachy, Battle of Gods and Giants, was a popular theme in Greek art from archaic through Hellenistic times and was a metaphor for the triumph of reason and order over chaos. In the pediment's left corner is one of the Trojan War's climactic events, Achilles' son Neoptolemos kills the enthroned king Priam. The fallen figure to the left of this group may be a dead Trojan. The master responsible for the Corfu pediments was a pioneer. And the composition shows all the signs of experimentation. The lack of narrative unity in the Corfu pediment and the figure's extraordinary diversity of scale eventually gave way to pedimental designs with freestanding figures in place of reliefs all acting out a single event and appearing the same size. But the Corfu designer already had shown the way. Th at sculptor realized, for example, the area beneath the raking cornice could be filled with gods and heroes of similar size by employing a combination of standing, leaning, kneeling, seated, and prostrate figures. The Corfu master also discovered that animals could be very useful space fellers because, unlike humans, they have one end taller than the other. Siphnian treasury Delphi with the 6th century BCE also came the construction of grandiose Ionic temples on the Aegean Islands and the west coast of Asia Minor. The gem of archaic Ionic architecture and architectural sculpture is, however, not a temple but a treasury, Fig 5-17, erected by the city of Siphnos in the sanctuary of Apollo, Fig 5, 17a, at Delphi. Greek treasuries were small buildings set up for the safe storage of votive offerings. At Delphi many polis expressed their civic pride by erecting these temple-like but non-peripteral structures. Athens built one with Doric columns in the porch and sculptured metopes in the frieze. The Siphnians equally characteristically employed the Ionic order for their Delphic treasury. Based on the surviving fragments now on display in the Delphi Museum. Archaeologists have been able to reconstruct the treasury's original appearance, Fig 5-17. Wealth from the island's gold and silver mines made such a luxurious building possible. In the porch, where one would expect to find fluted ionic columns, far more elaborate caryatids were employed instead. Caryatids are rare, even in ionic architecture, but they are unknown in Doric architecture, where they would have been discordant elements in that much more severe order. The Siphnian statue columns resemble contemporary Kore dressed in Ionian chitons and Himadians, Fig 5-11. Another Ionic feature of the Siphnian treasury is the continuous sculptured frieze on all four sides of the building. The north frieze represents the popular theme of the Gigantomachy, but it is a much more detailed rendition than that in the corner of the Corfu pediment, Fig 5-16. In the section reproduced here, Fig 5-18. Apollo and Artemis pursue a Florida eeing giant at the right, while behind them one of the lions pulling a goddess's chariot attacks a giant and bites into his midsection. Paint originally enlivened the crowded composition, 
and painted labels identify Ed the various protagonists. As they do on archaic black figure vases, figs 5 to 19 and 5 to 20. Some F figures had metal weapons. The effect must have been dazzling. On one of the shields the sculptor inscribed his name, unfortunately lost, a clear indication of pride in accomplishment. Vase Painting By the mid-6th century BCE, the Athenians, having learned the black figure technique from the Corinthians, Fig 5 to 5, had taken over the export market for fine painted ceramics, see Greek Vase Painting, page 110. Francois Vase The masterpiece of early Athenian black figure painting is the Francois Vase, Fig 5 to 19, named for the excavator who discovered it, in hundreds of fragments, in an Etruscan tomb at Chiasi. The vase is a new kind of crater with volute-shaped handles, probably inspired by costly metal prototypes. The signatures of both its painter, Clytia's Painted Me, and Potter, Ergotimo's Made Me, appear twice among the more than 200 F figures in five registers. Labels abound, naming humans and animals alike, even some inanimate objects. The painter devoted only the lowest band to the orientalizing repertoire of animals and sphinxes. The rest constitute a selective encyclopedia of Greek mythology, focusing on the exploits of Peleus and his son Achilles, the great hero of Homer's Iliad, and of Theseus, the legendary king of Athens. In the detail of the Centauromachi shown here, Fig 5 to 19, bottom. Lapiths, a northern Greek tribe and centaurs battle after a wedding celebration at which the man-beasts, who were invited guests, got drunk and attempted to abduct the Lapith maidens and young boys. Theseus, also on the guest list, was prominent among the centaurs' Greek adversaries. Clytias did not fill the spaces between his figures with decorative ornament, as did his geometric predecessors, figs 5-2 and 5-2a but his heroes still conform to the age-old composite type, Profi Le heads with frontal eyes, frontal torsos, and Profi Le legs and arms. His centaurs, however, are much more believable than their geometric counterparts, Fig 5 to 3. The man-horse combination is top-slash-bottom rather than front-slash-back. The lower, horse, portion has four legs of uniform type, and the upper part of the monster is fully human. In characteristic fashion, Clytias painted the animal section of the centaur in strict profile, whereas the human head and torso are a composite of frontal and profile views. He used a consistent profile for the more adventurous detail of the collapsed centaur at the right. Exekias The acknowledged master of the black figure technique was an Athenian named Exekias, whose vases were not only widely exported but copied as well. Perhaps his greatest work is an amphora, Fig 5-20, found in an Etruscan tomb at Volsi, which Exequias signed as both painter and potter. Unlike Clytias, Exequias did not divide the surface of the vase into a series of horizontal bands. Instead, he placed F figures of monumental stature in a single large framed panel. At the left is Achilles, fully armed, the mightiest Greek soldier in the war against Troy. He appears again on another of Exequias's amphoras, Fig 5, 20 a, battling Penthesilea, queen of the Amazons. On the Voltai amphora Achilles plays a dice game with his comrade Ajax during a lull in the Trojan conflict. Out of the lips of Achilles comes the word Tisera, 4. Ajax calls out Trya, 3. Although Ajax has taken off his helmet, both men hold their spears. Their shields are nearby. Each man is ready for action at a moment's notice. Th's depiction of the calm before the storm is the antithesis of the archaic preference for dramatic action. The gravity and tension that will characterize much classical Greek art of the next century, but that are generally absent in archaic art, already may be seen in this vase. Exequius had no equal as a black figure painter. Th's is evident in details such as the extraordinarily intricate engraving of the patterns on the hero's cloaks, highlighted with delicate touches of white, and in the brilliant composition. The arch formed by the backs of the two warriors echoes the shape of the rounded shoulders of the amphora. 
the shape of the vessel, compare figs 5, 20a and 5 to 21, is echoed again in the void between the heads and spears of Achilles and Ajax. Exekias also used the spears to lead the viewer's eyes toward the thrown dice, where the hero's eyes are fixed. Of course, those eyes do not really look down at the table but stare out from the profile heads in the old manner. For all his brilliance, Exekias was still wedded to many of the old conventions. Real innovation in figure drawing would have to await the invention of a new ceramic painting technique of greater versatility than black figure, with its dark silhouettes and incised details. Bilingual painting The birth of this new technique occurred around 530 BCE, and art historians refer to the person responsible as the Andokids painter, that is, the anonymous painter who decorated the vases signed by the potter Andokids. The differences between the two techniques can best be studied on a series of experimental vases with the same composition painted on both sides, once in black figure and once in the new technique. Red figure The Athenians produced these so-called bilingual vases for only a short time. An especially interesting example is an amphora, fig 5 to 21, by the Andokids painter that features copies of the Achilles and Ajax panel by Exekias his teacher. Intercapture the intensity of the model, and the treatment of details is decidedly inferior. Yet the new red figure technique had obvious advantages over the old black figure manner. Red figure is the opposite of black figure. What was previously black became red, and vice versa. The artist used the same black glaze for the figures, but instead of using the glaze to create silhouettes, the painter outlined the figures and then colored the background black. The ceramist reserved the red clay for the figures themselves and used a soft brush instead of a stiff metal graver to draw the interior details. This gave the red figure painter much greater flexibility. The artist could vary the thickness of the lines and even build up the glaze to give relief to curly hair or dilute it to create brown shades, thereby expanding the chromatic range of the Greek vase painter's craft. The Andokids painter very likely the potter Andokids himself did not yet appreciate the full potential of his own invention. Still, he created a technique that, in the hands of other, more skilled artists, helped revolutionize the art of drawing. Euphronios One of those younger and more adventurous painters was Euphronius, whose crater depicting the struggle between Heracles and Anteos, Fig 5-22 reveals the exciting possibilities of the new red figure technique. Anteos was a Libyan giant, a son of Earth, and he derived his power from contact with the ground. To defeat him, Heracles had to lift him into the air and strangle him while no part of the giant's body touched the Earth. In Euphronius's representation of the myth, the two wrestle on the ground, and Anteos still possesses enormous strength. Nonetheless, Heracles has the upper hand. The giant's face is a mask of pain. His eyes roll and his teeth are bared. His right arm is paralyzed. With the Fengers limp. On this crater, as on his other signed masterworks, including the most expensive vase ever purchased, Fig 5, 22a, Euphronius used the new red figure technique brilliantly. For example, he took advantage of the ability to dilute the glaze and produced a golden brown hue for Anteos's hair intentionally contrasting the giant's unkempt hair with the neat coiffure and carefully trimmed beard of the emotionless Greek hero. The artist also used thinned glaze to delineate the muscles of both figures. But rendering human anatomy convincingly was not his only interest. Euphronius also wished to show that his figures occupy space. He deliberately rejected the conventional composite posture for the human figure, which communicates so well the individual parts of the human body, and attempted instead to reproduce how a particular human body is seen. He presented, for example, not only Anteos's torso but also his right thigh from the front. The lower leg disappears behind the giant, and only part of the right foot is visible. The viewer must mentally make the connection between the upper leg and the foot. Euphronius did not create a two-dimensional panel filled with figures in stereotypical postures, as his archaic and pre-Greek predecessors always did. 
His panel is a window onto a mythological world with protagonists moving in three-dimensional space a revolutionary new conception of what a picture is supposed to be. Euthymides a preoccupation with the art of drawing per southeast is evident in a remarkable amphora, Fig 5-23, painted by Euthymides, a rival of Euphroniasis. The subject is appropriate for a wine storage jar 3 tipsy revelers. But the theme was little more than an excuse for the artist to experiment with the representation of unusual positions of the human form. It is no coincidence that the bodies do not overlap, for each is an independent figure study. Euthymides cast aside the conventional frontal and profile composite views. Instead, he painted torsos that are not two-dimensional surface patterns but are foreshortened, that is, drawn in a three-quarter view with some parts of the effigures closer to the viewer and others farther away. Most noteworthy is the central effigure, shown from the rear with a twisting spinal column and buttocks in three-quarter view. Earlier artists had no interest in attempting to depict figures seen from behind and at an angle because those postures not only are incomplete views but also do not show the main side of the human body. For Euthymides. However, the challenge of drawing a figure from this unusual viewpoint was a reward in itself. With understandable pride he proclaimed his achievement by adding to the formulaic signature Euthymides painted me the phrase as never Euphronius could do. Other vase painters also challenged themselves to outdo their contemporaries in representing the human form. One's Imos, for example, successfully drew a young woman's nude torso from a three-quarter view, Fig 5, 23a. Aegina and the transition to the classical period the years just before and after ER 500 BCE were also a time of dynamic transition in architecture and architectural sculpture. Some of the changes were evolutionary in nature, others revolutionary. Both kinds are evident in the Doric temple at Aegina dedicated to Aphia, a local nymph. Temple of Aphaia, Aegina the temple, Fig 5-24 sits on a prominent ridge with dramatic views out to the sea. The peripteral colonnade consists of six Doric columns on the façade and twelve on the Florida Anks. THS is a much more compact structure than the impressive but ungainly archaic temple, Fig 5-14, at Pistum. Even though the ratio of width to length is similar, Doric architects had learned a great deal in the half-century that elapsed between construction of the two temples. The columns of the Aegina temple are more widely spaced and more slender. The capitals create a smooth transition from the vertical shaft S below to the horizontal architrave above. Gone are the archaic Florida at and Ekin uses and bulging shaft S of the Pistum columns. The Aegina architect also refined the internal elevation and plan, Fig 5 to 25. In place of a single row of columns down the center of the cella is a double colonnade and each row has two stories. This arrangement allowed a statue to be placed on the central axis and also gave worshippers gathered in front of the building an unobstructed view through the pair of columns in the pronaos. Painted life-size statuary, Fig 5-26, FELL both pediments, in contrast to the high reliefs characteristic of most archaic temple pediments. The theme of both statuary groups was the battle of Greeks and Trojans, but the sculptors depicted different episodes. The compositions were nonetheless almost identical, with Athena at the center of the bloody combat. She is larger than all the other figures because she is superhuman, but all the mortal heroes are the same size, regardless of the statue's position in the pediment. Unlike the experimental design at Corfu, Fig 5-16, the Aegina pediments feature a unified theme and consistent scale. The designer was able to keep the size of the effigures constant by using the whole range of body postures from upright, Athena, to leaning, falling, kneeling, and lying, Greeks and Trojans. The Aegina sculptors set the pedimental statues in place around 490 BCE, as soon as construction of the temple concluded. Many scholars believe the statues at the eastern end were damaged and replaced with a new group a decade or two later, although some think both groups date after ER 480 BCE. In either case, it is instructive to compare the eastern and western effigures. The sculptor of the West Pediments Dying Warrior, Fig 5-27, to 
still conceived the statue in the archaic mode. The warrior's torso is rigidly frontal, and he looks out directly at the spectator with his face set in an archaic smile despite the bronze arrow that punctures his chest. He is like a mannequin in a store window whose arms and legs have been arranged by someone else for EFF fictive display. There is no sense whatsoever of a thinking and feeling human being. The comparable figure, fig 5 to 28, in the East pediment is radically different. This warrior's posture is more natural and more complex, with the torso placed at an angle to the viewer, compare fig 5 to 22. Moreover, he reacts to his wound as a Florida esh and blood human would. He knows that death is inevitable, but he still struggles to rise once again, using his shield for support. He does not look out at the spectator. Th's dying warrior is concerned with his plight, not with the viewer. No more than a decade separates the two statues, but they belong to different eras. The Eastern warrior is not a creation of the archaic world, when sculptors imposed anatomical patterns, and smiles, on statues. Th's statue belongs to the classical world, where statues move as humans move and possess the self-consciousness of real men and women. This constitutes a radical change in the conception of the nature of statuary. In sculpture, as in painting, the classical revolution had occurred. E. A. R. Lee A. North Dakota High Classical Periods Art historians date the beginning of the classical asterisk age from a historical event, the defeat of the Persian invaders of Greece by the allied Hellenic city-states. Shortly after E.R. the Persians occupied and sacked Athens in 480 BCE, the Greeks won a decisive naval victory over the Persians at Salamis. It had been a difficult war, and at times it appeared Asia would swallow up Greece and the Persian king Xerxes, see Chapter 2, would rule over all. When the Persians destroyed the Greek city Miltos in 494 BCE, they killed the male inhabitants and sold the women and children into slavery. The narrow escape of the Greeks from domination by Asian barbarians nurtured a sense of Hellenic identity so strong that from then on the history of European civilization would be distinct from the civilization of Asia, even though they continued to interact. Typical of the time were the views of the great dramatist Aeschylus, who celebrated in his Oresteia trilogy, the triumph of reason and law over barbarous crimes, blood feuds, and mad vengeance. As a veteran himself of the epic battle of Marathon, Aeschylus repudiated in majestic verse all the slavish and inhuman traits of nature the Greeks at that time of crisis associated with the Persians. Architecture and Architectural Sculpture The decades following the removal of the Persian threat are universally considered the high point of Greek civilization. This is the era of the dramatists Sophocles and Euripides, as well as Aeschylus. The historian Herodotus, the statesman Pericles, the philosopher Socrates, and many of the most famous Greek architects, sculptors, and painters. Temple of Zeus, Olympia Thefers great monument of classical art and architecture is the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Site of the Olympic Games The architect was Liban of Elis who began work on the temple about 470 BCE and completed it by 457 BCE. Today, the structure is in ruins, its picturesque tumbled column drums an eloquent reminder of the EFFECT of the passage of time on even the grandest monuments humans have built. A good idea of its original appearance can be gleaned, however, from a slightly later Doric temple, Fig 5-29, Modeled closely on the Olympian shrine of Zeus the temple usually identify it as the second temple of Hera at Pistum but possibly a temple dedicated to Apollo. The plans and elevations of both temples follow the pattern of the Temple of Aphia, Fig 5-25, at Aegina, an even number of columns, 6, on the short ends, 2 columns in antis, and 2 rows of columns in 2 stories inside the cella but the Temple of Zeus was more lavishly decorated than even the Aphia Temple. Statues fell both pediments, and narrative reliefs adorned the six metopes over the doorway in the Pronaos and the matching six of the Epistotomus. The subject of the Temple of Zeus's east pediment, Fig 5-30, is the chariot race between Pelops, from whom the Peloponnesus region takes its name, 
and King Oina Mouse. The story, which had deep local significance, is a sinister one. Oina Mouse had one daughter, Hippodamia, and a prophecy foretold that he would die if she married. Consequently, Oina Mouse challenged any suitor who wished to make Hippodamia his bride to a chariot race from Olympia to Corinth. If the suitor won, he also won the hand of the king's daughter. But if he lost, Oina Mouse killed him. The outcome of each race was predetermined, because Oina Mouse possessed the divine horses of his father Ares. To ensure his victory when all others had failed, Pelops resorted to bribing the king's groom, Myrtilos, to rig the royal chariot so that it would collapse during the race. Oina Mouse was killed and Pelops won his bride, but he drowned Myrtilos rather than pay his debt to him. Before he died, Myrtilos brought a curse on Pelops and his descendants. Th's curse led to the murder of Pelops's son Atreus and to events that figure prominently in some of the greatest Greek tragedies of the classical era, Aeschylus's three plays known collectively as the Oresteia, the sacrifice CE by Atreus's son Agamemnon of his daughter Iphigenia, the slaying of Agamemnon by Aegisthus, lover of Agamemnon's wife Clytenestra, and the murder of Aegisthus and Clytenestra by Orestes, the son of Agamemnon and Clytenestra. Indeed, the petty mental statues, Fig 5 to 30, which faced toward the starting point of all Olympic chariot races, are posed as if actors on a stage Zeus in the center, Oina Mouse and his wife on one side, Pelops and Hippodamia on the other, and their respective chariots to each side. All are quiet. The horrible events known to every spectator have yet to occur. Only one man reacts a seer, Fig 5 to 31. Who knows the future? He is a remarkable figure. Unlike the gods, heroes, and noble youths and maidens who are the almost exclusive subjects of archaic and classical Greek statuary, this seer is a rare depiction of old age. He has a balding, wrinkled head and sagging musculature and a shocked expression on his face. This is a true show of emotion, unlike the stereotypical archaic smile without precedent in earlier Greek sculpture and not a regular feature of Greek art until the Hellenistic age. In the West Pediment, Apollo, Fig 5-32, the central figure, is also at rest, but all around him is a chaotic scene of Greeks battling centaurs, Fig 5-32a. A mixture of calm, even pensive, figures and others involved in violent action also characterizes the narrative reliefs of the twelve metopes of the Zeus Temple. They are thematically connected with Olympia, for they depict the twelve labors of Heracles, see Heracles, greatest of Greek heroes. Above, the legendary founder of the Olympic Games. In the metope illustrated here, Fig 5-33, Heracles holds up the sky, with the aid of the goddess Athena and a cushion, in place of Atlas, who had undertaken the dangerous journey to fetch the golden apples of the Hesperides for the hero. Heracles will soon transfer the load back to Atlas, at the right, still holding the apples, but now each of the very high relief figures in the metope stands quietly with the same serene dignity as the statues in the East Pediment, Fig 5-30, and Apollo, Fig 5-32, in the West Pediment. In both attitude and dress, simple. Doric peploi for the women. These Olympia figures display a severity that contrasts sharply with the smiling and elaborately clad figures of the late archaic period. Consequently, many art historians call this early classical phase of Greek art the severe style. Statuary The hallmark of early classical statuary is the abandonment of the rigid and unnatural Egyptian-inspired pose of archaic statues. The figures in the Olympia pediments exemplify this radical break with earlier practice but the change occurred even earlier at the very moment Greece was under attack by the Persians. Kritios boy Although it is well under life-size, the marble statue known as the Crisios boy, Fig 5-34, because art historians once thought it was the work of the sculptor Crisios is one of the most important statues in the history of art. Never before had a sculptor been concerned with portraying how a human being, as opposed to a stone image, truly stands. Real people do not stand in the stiff, legged pose of the Kuroi and Kore or their Egyptian predecessors. 
humans shift their weight and the position of the torso around the vertical, but Florida executable, axis of the spine. When humans move, the body's elastic musculoskeletal structure dictates a harmonious, smooth motion of all its parts. The sculptor of the Crisio's boy was the FERST, or one of the FERST, to grasp this anatomical fact and to represent it in statuary. The youth has a slight dip to the right hip, indicating the shifting of weight onto his left leg. His right leg is bent, at ease. The head also turns slightly to the right and tilts, breaking the unwritten rule of frontality dictating the form of virtually all earlier statues. Th's weight shift, which art historians describe as contraposto, counterbalance, separates classical from archaic Greek statuary. RIACE warrior and unknown sculptor carried the innovations of the Crisios boy even further in the bronze statue, Fig 5-35, of a warrior found in the sea near Rias at the toe of the Italian boot. It is one of a pair of statues divers accidentally discovered in the cargo of a ship that sank in antiquity on its way from Greece probably to Rome, where Greek sculpture was much admired. Known as the Rias Bronzes, the two statues had to undergo several years of cleaning and restoration after er nearly two millennia of submersion in salt water, but they are nearly intact. The statue shown here lacks only its shield, spear, and helmet. It is a masterpiece of hollow casting, see hollow casting life-size bronze statues, above, and fig 5 to 36, with inlaid eyes, silver teeth and eyelashes, and copper lips and nipples, fig eye, 17. The weight shift is more pronounced than in the Crisio's boy. The warrior's head turns more forcefully to the right, his shoulders tilt, his hips swing more markedly, and his arms have been freed from the body. Natural motion in space has replaced archaic frontality and rigidity. Charioteer of Delphi A bronze statuary group that equals or exceeds the Rias warrior in technical quality is the chariot group set up a decade or two earlier by the tyrant Polyzolos of Gela, Sicily, to commemorate his victory in the Pythian Games at Delphi, Fig 5, 17a. Almost all that remains of the large group composed of Polyzolos's driver, the chariot, the team of horses, and a young groom is the bronze charioteer, Fig 5-37. He stands in an almost archaic pose, but the turn of the head and feet in opposite directions as well as a slight twist at the waist are in keeping with the severe style. The moment the sculptor chose for depiction was not during the frenetic race but aft er, when the driver modestly held his horses quietly in the winner's circle. The charioteer grasps the reins in his outstretched right hand, the lower left arm, cast separately, is missing, and he wears the standard charioteer's garment girdled high and held in at the shoulders and the back to keep it from Florida apping. The folds emphasize both the verticality and calm of the figure and recall the Florida youths of a Greek column. The effilet that holds the charioteer's hair in place is inlaid with silver. The eyes are glass paste, shaded by delicate bronze lashes individually cut from a sheet of bronze and soldered to the head. Artemision Zeus the male human form in motion is. In contrast, the subject of another early classical bronze statue, Fig 5-38, which, like the Rias warrior, divers found in an ancient shipwreck, this time off the coast of Greece itself at Cape Artemision. The bearded god once hurled a weapon held in his right hand, probably a thunderbolt, in which case he is Zeus. A less likely suggestion is that this is Poseidon with his trident, see Gods and Goddesses, page 107. The pose could be employed equally well for a javelin thrower. Both arms are boldly extended, and the right heel is raised off the ground, underscoring the lightness and stability of holocaust monumental statues. Myron, Diskobolosa bronze statue similar to the Artemision Zeus was the renowned Discobolos, Discus Th Rower, by the early classical master Myron. The original is lost. Only marble copies, Fig 5 to 39, survive, made in Roman times, when demand so far exceeded the supply of Greek statues that a veritable industry was born to meet the call for Greek statuary to display in public places and private villas alike. Usually, 
the copies were of less costly painted marble, which presented a very different appearance from shiny bronze. In most cases, the copyist also had to add an intrusive tree trunk to support the great weight of the stone statue into place. Struts between arms and body to strengthen weak points. The copies rarely approached the quality of the originals, and the Roman sculptors sometimes took liberties with their models according to their own tastes and needs. Occasionally, for example, sculptors created a mirror image of the original for a specified C setting. Nevertheless, the copies are indispensable today. Without them it would be impossible to reconstruct the history of Greek sculpture after the archaic period. Myron's discus th rower is a vigorous action statue, like the Artemision Zeus, but the sculptor posed the body in an almost archaic manner, with prophy le limbs and a nearly frontal chest, suggesting the tension of a coiled spring. Like the arm of a pendulum clock, the right arm of the discobolos has reached the apex of its arc but has not yet begun to swing down again. Myron froze the action and arranged the body and limbs to form two intersecting arcs, one from the discus to the left hand, one from the head to the right knee, creating the impression of a tightly stretched bow a moment before the archer releases the string. Th's tension, however, is not mirrored in the athlete's face, which remains expressionless. Once again, as in the warrior statue, Fig 5 to 28, from the Aegina East pediment. The head is turned away from the spectator. In contrast to archaic athlete statues, the classical disco bolos does not perform for the spectator but concentrates on the task at hand. P-O-L-Y-K-L-E-I-T-O-S, D-O-R-Y-P-H-O-R-O-S One of the most frequently copied Greek statues was the Doraphoros, Spear Bearer, by Polykolatos, the sculptor whose work epitomizes the intellectual rigor of classical art. The best marble replica, Fig 5-40, stood in a palestra, gymnasium, at Pompeii, where it served as a model for Roman athletes. The Doraphoros was the embodiment of Polykolatos's vision of the ideal statue of a nude male athlete or warrior. The spear bearer may also have held a shield. In fact, the sculptor made it as a demonstration piece to accompany a treatise on the subject. Spear bearer is a modern descriptive title for the statue. The name Polykolatos assigned to it was canon, see Polykolatos's prescription for the perfect statue, page 132. The Doraphoros is the culmination of the evolution in Greek statuary from the archaic Kouros to the Krishios boy to the Rias warrior. The contraposto is more pronounced than ever before in a standing statue, but Polykolatos was not content with simply rendering a figure that stands naturally. His aim was to impose order on human movement, to make it beautiful, to perfect it. He achieved this through a system of cross-balance. What appears at FERST to be a casually natural pose is, in fact, the result of an extremely complex and subtle organization of the figure's various parts. Note, for instance, how the straight hanging arm echoes the rigid supporting leg, providing the figure's right side with the columnar stability needed to anchor the left side's dynamically flexed limbs. If read anatomically, however, the tensed and relaxed limbs may be seen to oppose each other diagonally the right arm and the left leg are relaxed, and the tensed supporting leg opposes the flexed arm, which held a spear. In like manner, the head turns to the right while the hips twist slightly to the left. And although the Doraphoros seems to take a step forward, he does not move. Th is dynamic asymmetrical balance, this motion while at rest and the resulting harmony of opposites are the essence of the Polykolatan style. The Athenian Acropolis While Polykolatos was formulating his canon in Argos, the Athenians, under the leadership of Pericles, were at work on one of the most ambitious building projects ever undertaken, the reconstruction of the Acropolis aft er the Persian sack. In September 480 BCE, the Athenian commander Th Mysticles decisively defeated the Persian navy off the island of Salamis, southwest of Athens, and forced it to retreat to Asia. Athens, despite the damage it suffered at the hands of the army of Xerxes, emerged from the war with enormous power and prestige. Less than two years later, in 478 BCE, 
the Greeks formed an alliance for mutual protection against any renewed threat from the east. The new confederacy came to be known as the Delian League, because its headquarters were on the sacred island of Delos, midway between the Greek mainland and the coast of Asia Minor. Although at the outset each League member had an equal vote, Athens was FERST among equals, providing the allied Florida eat commander and determining which cities were to furnish ships and which were instead to pay an annual tribute to the treasury at Delos. Continued efficting against the Persians kept the Delian alliance intact, but Athens gradually assumed a dominant role. In 454 BCE, the League's treasury was transferred to Athens, ostensibly for security reasons. Pericles, who was only in his teens when the Persians laid waste to the Acropolis, was by mid-century the recognized leader of the Athenians, and he succeeded in converting the alliance into an Athenian empire. Tribute continued to be paid. But the Athenians did not spend the surplus reserves for the common good of the allied Greek states. Instead, Pericles expropriated the money to pay the enormous cost of executing his grand plan to embellish the Acropolis of Athens. The reaction of the allies in reality the subjects of Athens was predictable. Plutarch, who wrote a biography of Pericles in the early 2nd century CE, reported not only the wrath the Greek victims of Athenian tyranny felt but also the protest voiced against Pericles' decision even in the Athenian assembly. Greece, Pericles. Enemies said, had been dealt a terrible, wanton insult when Athens used the funds contributed out of necessity for a common war effort to gild and embellish itself with images and extravagant temples like some pretentious woman decked out with precious stones. That the Delian League was the source of the funds used for the Acropolis building program is important to keep in mind when examining those great and universally admired buildings erected to realize Pericles' vision of his polis reborn from the ashes of the Persian sack. They are not the glorious fruits of Athenian democracy but are instead the by-products of tyranny and the abuse of power. Too often art and architectural historians do not ask how patrons, whether public or private, paid for the monuments they commissioned. The answer can be very revealing and very embarrassing. Portrait of Pericles A number of extant Roman marble sculptures are copies of a famous bronze portrait statue of Pericles by K. Arzilas, who was born on Crete but worked in Athens. The Athenians set up the portrait on the Acropolis probably immediately after E.R. their leader's death in 429 BCE. K. Arzilas depicted Pericles in heroic nudity, and his portrait must have resembled the Rias warrior, Fig 5-35. The copies reproduce the head only. Sometimes, as in Fig 5-41, in the form of a herm, a bust on a square pillar. The inscription on the herm reads Pericles, son of Xanthippus. The Athenian Pericles wears the helmet of Astrategus, general. The elective position he held fifteen times. The Athenian leader was said to have had an abnormally elongated skull, and K. Arzilas recorded this feature, while also concealing it, by providing a glimpse through the helmet's eye slots of the hair at the top of the head. This, together with the unblemished features of Pericles' aloof face and, no doubt, his body's perfect physique led Pliny to assert that K. Arzilas had the ability to make noble men appear even more noble in their portraits. This praise was apt because the Acropolis statue was not a portrait in the modern sense of a record of specify C features, but an image of an individual that conformed to the classical ideal of beauty. Pliny refers to Chrysalis's portrait as the Olympian Pericles, because the statue made Pericles appear almost godlike for Periclean Acropolis. The centerpiece of the Periclean building program on the Acropolis, Fig 5-42, was the Parthenon, Figs 5-1 and 5-43, number 1, dedicated to Athena Prothenus. And erected in the remarkably short period between 447 and 438 BCE. Work on the temple's ambitious sculptural ornamentation continued until 432 BCE. As soon as the Athenian builders completed work on the Parthenon, construction commenced on the Propylaea, Fig 5-43, No. 2, the grand new western gateway to the Acropolis, the only accessible site of the natural plateau. Begun in 437 BCE, 
work stopped in 431 at the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta and never resumed. Two later temples. The Erechtheion, Fig 5-43, No. 4, and the Temple of Athena Nike, Fig 5-43, No. 5, built after Pericles died, were probably also part of the original project. The greatest Athenian architects and sculptors of the classical period focused their attention on the construction and decoration of these four buildings. That these ancient buildings exist at all today is something of a miracle. In the Middle Ages, the Parthenon, for example, became a Byzantine and later a Roman Catholic Church and then, after the Ottoman conquest of Greece, a mosque. With each rededication, religious officials remodeled the building. The Christians early on removed the colossal statue of Athena inside. The churches had a great curved apse at the east end housing the altar. The Ottomans added a minaret, tower used to call Muslims to prayer. In 1687, the Venetians besieged the Acropolis. One of their rockets scored a direct hit on the ammunition depot the Ottomans had installed in part of the Parthenon. The resultant explosion blew out the building's center. To make matters worse, the Venetians subsequently tried to remove some of the statues from the Parthenon's pediments. In more than one case, the workmen dropped the statues, which smashed on the ground. From 1801 to 1803, Thomas Bruce, 1766-1841, Lord Elgin, brought most of the surviving sculptures to England. For the past two centuries, they have been on exhibit in the British Museum, figs 5-47-5-50, although Greece has appealed many times for the return of the Elgin marbles and built a new museum near the Acropolis to house them. Today, a uniquely modern blight threatens the Parthenon and the other buildings of the Periclean Age. The corrosive emissions of factories and automobiles are decomposing the ancient marbles. A comprehensive campaign has been underway for some time to protect the columns and walls from further deterioration. What little original sculpture remained in place when modern restoration began is now in the new museum's climate-controlled rooms. Parthenon, architecture despite the ravages of time and humanity, most of the Parthenon's peripteral colonnade, Fig 5-1, is still standing, or has been really cited, and art historians know a great deal about the building and its sculptural program. The architect was Ictinos, assisted, according to some sources, by Calicrates. The statue of Athena, Fig 5-46, in the cella was the work of Phidias, who was also the overseer of the temple's sculptural decoration. In fact, Plutarch stated that Phidias was in charge of the entire Acropolis project. Just as the contemporaneous Dora Foros, Fig 5-40, may be seen as the culmination of nearly two centuries of searching for the ideal proportions of the various human body parts, so, too, the Parthenon may be viewed as the ideal solution to the Greek architect's quest for perfect proportions in Doric temple design, CTHE Perfect Temple, page 105. Its well-spaced columns, Fig 5-44, with their slender shafts, and the capitals, with their straight-sided conical ekin uses, are the ultimate refinement of the bulging and squat Doric columns and compressed capitals of the archaic Hera temple, Fig 5-14, at Pistum. The Parthenon architects and Polykolatos were kindred spirits in their belief that beautiful proportions resulted from strict adherence to harmonic numerical ratios whether in a temple more than 200 feet long or a life-size statue of a nude man. For the Parthenon, the controlling ratio for the symmetry of the parts may be expressed algebraically as x equal to y plus 1. Thus, for example, the temple's plan, fig 5 to 45, called for 8 columns on the short ends and 17 on the long sides, because 17 equal, 2 times 8, plus 1. The stylobate's ratio of length to width is 9, 4, because 9 equal, 2 times 4, plus 1. Th's ratio also characterizes the cella's proportion of length to width, the distance between the centers of two adjacent column drums, the interaxial, in proportion to the column's diameter, and so forth. 
the Parthenon's harmonious design and the mathematical precision of the sizes of its constituent elements tend to obscure the fact that this temple, as actually constructed, is quite irregular in shape. Th rough out the building are pronounced deviations from the strictly horizontal and vertical lines assumed to be the basis of all Greek post and lintel structures. The stylobate, for example, curves upward at the center on the sides and both facades, forming a kind of shallow dome, and this curvature carries up into the entablature. Moreover, the peristyle columns, figs 5 to 1 and 5 to 44, lean inward slightly. THOs at the corners have a diagonal inclination and are also about 2 inches thicker than the rest. If their lines continued, they would meet about 1.5 miles above the temple. THSA deviations from the norm meant that virtually every Parthenon block and drum had to be carved according to the special set of specifications dictated by its unique place in the structure. This was obviously a daunting task and the builders must have had a reason for introducing these so-called Rifi northeastments in the Parthenon. Some modern observers note, for example, how the curving of horizontal lines and the tilting of vertical ones create a dynamic balance in the building a kind of architectural contraposto and give it a greater sense of life. The oldest recorded explanation, however, may be the most likely. Vitruvius a Roman architect of the late 1st century BCE who claims to have had access to Ictinos's treatise on the Parthenon, again, note the kinship with the canon of Polycolatos, maintained that these adjustments were made to compensate for optical illusions. Vitruvius noted, for example, that if a stylobate is laid out on a level surface, it will appear to sag at the center. He also recommended that the corner columns of a building should be thicker because they are surrounded by light and would otherwise appear thinner than their neighbors. The Parthenon is irregular in other ways as well. One of the ironies of this most famous of all Doric temples is that it is contaminated by ionic elements. Although the cella, fig 5 to 46, had a two-story Doric colonnade, the back room, which housed the goddess's treasury and the tribute collected from the Delian League, had four tall and slender ionic columns as sole supports for the super, structure, fig 5 to 45. And whereas the temple's exterior had a standard Doric frieze, fig 5 to 44, the inner frieze, fig 5 to 50, that ran around the top of the cella wall was ionic. Perhaps this fusion of Doric and ionic elements reflection ECTs the Athenians' belief that the Ionians of the Aegean Islands and Asia Minor were descendants of Athenian settlers and were therefore their kin. Or it may be Pericles and Ictinos's way of suggesting that Athens was the leader of all the Greeks. In any case, a mix of Doric and ionic features characterizes the 5th century BCE buildings of the Acropolis as a whole. Athena Prothenus the costly decision to incorporate two sculptured friezes in the Parthenon's design is symptomatic. Th's Pentelic marble temple was more lavishly adorned than any Greek temple before it, Doric or Ionic. A mythological scene appears in every one of the 92 Doric metopes, and every inch of the 524 foot long Ionic frieze depicts a procession and cavalcade. Dozens of larger than life size statues fell both pediments and inside was the most expensive item of all Phidias's Athena Prothenus. A colossal gold and ivory, Chris Elephantine, statue of the Virgin Goddess. Art historians know a great deal about Phidias's lost statue from descriptions by Greek and Latin authors and from Roman copies. A model, Fig 5-46, gives a good idea of its appearance and setting. Athena stood 38 feet tall, and to a large extent Ictinos designed the Parthenon around her. To accommodate the statue's huge size, the cella had to be wider than usual. This, in turn, dictated the width of the façade eight columns at a time when six columns were the norm, figs 5 to 25 and 5 to 29. Athena was fully armed with shield, spear, and helmet, and she held Nike, the winged female personification of victory, in her extended right hand. No one doubts that this Nike referred to the victory of 479 BCE. The memory of the Persian sack of the Acropolis was still vivid, and the Athenians were intensely conscious that by driving back the Persians, they had saved their civilization from the eastern barbarians who had committed atrocities at Miltos. 
In fact, Phidias's Athena Prothenus incorporated multiple allusions to the Persian defeat. On the thick solace of Athena's sandals was a representation of a centauromachy. High reliefs depicting the battle of Greeks and Amazons, Amazonomachy, in which Thesius drove the Amazons out of Athens, emblazoned the exterior of her shield. On the shield's interior, Phidias painted a gigantomachy. Each of these mythological contests was a metaphor for the triumph of order over chaos, of civilization over barbarism, and of Athens over Persia. Parthenon, Metopes Phidias took up these same themes again in the Parthenon's Metopes, Fig 5-45. The best preserved Metopes although the paint on these and all the other Parthenon marbles long ago disappeared are those of the south side, which depicted the Battle of Lapiths and Centaurs a combat in which Thesius played a major role. On one extraordinary slab, Fig 5-47, a triumphant centaur rises up on its hind legs, exulting over the crumpled body of the Greek it has defeated. The relief is so high that parts are fully in the round. Some have broken off. The sculptor brilliantly distinguished the vibrant, powerful form of the living beast from the lifeless corpse on the ground. In other metopes, the Greeks have the upper hand, but the full set suggests that the battle was a difficult one against a dangerous enemy and that losses as well as victories occurred. The same was true of the war against the Persians, and the Centauromachy Metopes and also the Gigantomachy. Amazonomachy, and Trojan War Metopes are allegories for the Greek-Persian confloict of the early Fe Foot Age century BCE. Parthenon Pediments The subjects of the two pediments were especially appropriate for a temple that celebrated Athena and the Athenians. The east pediment depicted the birth of the goddess. At the west was the contest between Athena and Poseidon to determine which one would become the city's patron deity. Athena won, giving her name to the polis and its citizens. It is significant that in the story and in the pediment the Athenians are the judges of the relative merits of the two gods. The selection of this theme for the temple reflection ECTs the same arrogance that led to the use of Delian League funds to adorn the Acropolis. The Christians removed the center of the East Pediment when they added an apse to the Parthenon at the time of its conversion into a church. What remains are the spectators to the left and the right who witnessed Athena's birth on Mount Olympus. At the far left, Fig 5-48, are part of the head and arms of Helios, the sun, and his chariot horses rising from the pediment floor, Fig 5-44. Next to them is a powerful male effigure usually identified as Dionysus or possibly Heracles, who entered the realm of the gods on completion of his twelve labors, see Heracles, page 128. At the right, Fig 5-49, are three goddesses, probably Hestia, Dione, and Aphrodite, see gods and goddesses, page 107, and either Selene, the moon, or Nyx, night, and more horses, this time sinking below the pediment's floor. Here, Phidias, who must have designed the composition even if his assistants executed it, discovered an entirely new way to deal with the awkward triangular frame of the pediment. Its floor is now the horizon line, and charioteers and their horses move through it effortlessly. The individual figures even the animals, are brilliantly characterized. The horses of the sun, at the beginning of the day, are energetic. Those of the moon or night, having labored until dawn, are weary. The reclining figures fill the space beneath the raking cornice beautifully. Dionysus slash Heracles and Aphrodite in the lap of her mother Dione are monumental Olympian presences yet totally relaxed organic forms. The Athenian sculptors fully understood not only the surface appearance of human anatomy, both male and female, but also the mechanics of how muscles and bones make the body move. The Phidian workshop mastered the rendition of clothed forms as well. In the Dione Aphrodite group, the thin and heavy folds of the garments alternately reveal and conceal the main and lesser body masses while swirling in a compositional tide that subtly unifies the two figures. The articulation and integration of the bodies produce a wonderful variation of surface and play of light and shade. Parthenon, Ionic Frieze In many ways the most remarkable part of the Parthenon sculptural program is the inner Ionic Frieze, Fig 5-50. to 50. 
Scholars still debate its subject, but most agree it represents the Panathena festival procession that took place every four years in Athens. If this identification is correct, the Athenians judged themselves fit for inclusion in the temple's sculptural decoration the first instance in Greek art of the depiction of a human event on a temple. It is another example of the Athenians' extraordinarily high sense of self-worth. The procession began at the Dipylon Gate, passed through the Agora, Central Square, and ended on the Acropolis, where the Athenians placed a new peplus on an ancient wooden statue of Athena. That statue, probably similar in general appearance to the Lady of Oxer, Fig 5-6, had been housed in the archaic temple the Persians raised in 480 BCE but the Athenians removed it before the attack for security reasons and eventually installed it in the Erechtheion, Fig 5-53, Number 1. On the Parthenon frieze the procession begins on the west. That is, at the temple's rear, the side facing the gateway to the Acropolis. It then moves in parallel lines down the long north and south sides of the building and ends at the center of the east frieze, over the doorway to the cella housing Phidias's statue, Fig 5 to 45. It is noteworthy that the upper part of the frieze is in higher relief than the lower part so that the more distant and more shaded upper zone is as legible from the ground as the lower part of the frieze. This is another instance of how the Parthenon's designers took optical EFFECTs into consideration. The frieze vividly communicates the procession's acceleration and deceleration. At the outset, on the west side, marshals gather and youths mount their horses. On the north, Fig 5 to 50, top, and south, the momentum picks up as the cavalcade moves from the lower town to the Acropolis, accompanied by chariots, musicians, jar carriers, and animals destined for sacrifice. E. On the east, seated gods and goddesses, Fig 5 to 50, center, the invited guests, watch the procession slow almost to a halt, Fig 5 to 50, bottom as it nears its goal at the shrine of Athena's ancient wooden idol. Most remarkable of all is the role assigned to the Olympian deities. They do not take part in the festival or determine its outcome but are merely spectators. Aphrodite, in fact, extends her left arm to draw her son Eros's attention to the Athenians, just as today a parent at a parade would point out important people to a child. Indeed, the Athenian people were important self-important, one might say. They were the masters of an empire, and in Pericles' famous funeral oration, he painted a picture of Athens that elevated its citizens almost to the stature of gods. The Parthenon celebrated the greatness of Athens and the Athenians as much as it honored Athena. Propylaia Even before all the sculptures were in place on the Parthenon, work began on a new monumental entrance to the Acropolis, the Propylaia. Fig 5-51. The architect entrusted with this important commission was Nasikles. The site was a difficult one, on a steep slope, but Nasikles succeeded in disguising the change in ground level by splitting the building into eastern and western sections, Fig 5-43, Number 2, each one resembling a Doric temple facade. Practical considerations dictated that the space between the central pair of columns on each side be enlarged. This was the path the chariots and animals of the Panathena festival procession took, and they required a wide ramped causeway. To either side of the central ramp were stairs for pedestrian traffic. Inside, tall, slender ionic columns supported the split-level roof. Once again an Athenian architect mixed the two orders on the Acropolis. But as with the Parthenon, the Doric order was the choice for the stately exterior. Nasikal's full plan for the Propylaea was never executed because of the change in the fortunes of Athens after the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War in 431 BCE. Of the side wings that were part of the original project, only the northwest one, Fig 5-43, Number 3, was completed. Th at wing is of special importance in the history of art. In Roman times it housed a Pinakothuk, picture gallery. In it were displayed paintings on wood panels by some of the major artists of the 5th century BCE. It is uncertain whether this was the wing's original function. If it was, the Propylaeus Pinakothic is the first recorded structure built for the specify C purpose of displaying paintings, 
and it is the forerunner of modern museums. Erechtheion. In 421 BCE, work finally began on the temple that was to replace the archaic Athena temple the Persians had destroyed. The new structure, the Erechtheion, figs 5 to 52 and 5 to 53, built to the north of the old temple's remains, was to be a multiple shrine, however. It honored Athena and housed the ancient wood image of the goddess that was the goal of the Panathena festival procession. But it also incorporated shrines to a host of other gods and demigods who loomed large in the city's legendary past. Among these were Erechtheus, an early king of Athens. During whose reign the ancient idol of Athena was said to have fallen from the heavens, and Cecrops, another king of Athens, who served as judge of the contest between Athena and Poseidon. In fact, the site chosen for the new temple was the very spot where that contest occurred. Poseidon had staked his claim to Athens by striking the Acropolis rock with his trident and producing a salt water spring. The imprint of his trident remained for Athenians of the historical period to see. Nearby, Athena had miraculously caused an olive tree to grow. This tree still stood as a constant reminder of her victory over Poseidon. The asymmetrical plan, Fig 5 to 53, of the Ionic Erechtheion is unique for a Greek temple and the antithesis of the simple and harmoniously balanced plan of the Doric Parthenon across the way. Its irregular form reflection ECT the need to incorporate the tomb of King Cecrops and other pre existing shrines, the trident mark, and the olive tree into a single complex. The unknown architect responsible for the building also had to struggle with the problem of uneven terrain. The area could not be leveled by terracing because that would disturb the ancient sacred sites. As a result, the Erechtheion has four sides of very different character, and each side rests on a different ground level. Perhaps to compensate for the awkward character of the building as a whole, the architect took great care with the Erechtheion's decorative details. The Ionic capitals were inlaid with gold, rock crystal, and colored glass, and the frieze received special treatment. The stone chosen was the dark blue limestone of Eleusis to contrast with the white pentelic marble of the walls and columns and the marble relief effigures attached to the dark frieze. The Erechtheion's most striking and famous feature is its south porch, Fig 5 to 54, where the architect replaced Ionic columns with caryatids, as on the Ionic Siphonian treasury. Fig 5 to 17, at Delphi. The archaic caryatids resemble 6th century BCE Core, and their classical counterparts equally characteristically look like Phidian era statues. Although the caryatids exhibit the weight shift that was standard for the Fe Foot Age century BCE, the flute like drapery folds concealing their stiff, weight bearing legs underscores their role as architectural supports. The figures have enough rigidity to suggest the structural column and just the degree of flexibility needed to suggest the living body. Temple of Athena Nike Another Ionic building on the Athenian Acropolis is the small Temple of Athena Nike, Fig 5-55. Designed by Callicrates, who designed the Parthenon with Ictinos and may have been responsible for that temple's Ionic elements. The Athena Nike Temple is Amphi Pro style, see Greek Temple Plans page 115, with four columns on both the east and west facades. It stands on what used to be a Mycenaean bastion near the Propylaea and greets all visitors entering Athena's great sanctuary. Like the Parthenon, this temple commemorated the victory over the Persians and not just in its name. The sculptors devoted part of the frieze to a representation of the decisive battle at Marathon, which turned the tide against the Persians a human event, as in the Parthenon's Panathena festival procession frieze. But on the Athena Nike temple, the Athenians chronicled a specify C occasion, not a recurring event involving anonymous citizens. Around the building, at the bastion's edge, was a parapet decorated with exquisite reliefs. The theme of the balustrade matched that of the temple proper victory. Dozens of images of Nike adorn the parapet, always in different attitudes. Sometimes she erects trophies bedecked with Persian spoils. Other times she brings forward sacrificial bulls for Athena. One relief, Fig 5 to 56, shows Nike adjusting her sandal an awkward posture that the sculptor rendered elegant and graceful. 
the artist carried the style of the Parthenon pediments, fig 5 to 49, even further and created a figure whose garments cling so tightly to the body that they seem almost transparent. As if drenched with water. The sculptor was, however, interested in much more than revealing the supple beauty of the young female body. The drapery folds form intricate linear patterns unrelated to the body's anatomical structure and have a life of their own as abstract designs. HEGESO steel Although the decoration of the great building projects on the Acropolis must have occupied most of the finest sculptors of Athens in the second half of the Fe Foot Age century BCE, other commissions were available in the city, notably in the Dipylon Cemetery. There, around 400 BCE, a beautiful and touching grave steel, Fig 5 to 57, in the style of the Temple of Athena Nike parapet reliefs was set up in memory of a woman named Hegiso. Its subject a young woman in her home, attended by her maid, Cthe Hegiso steel, above, and its composition have close parallels in classical vase painting. Painting In the classical period, some of the most renowned artists were the painters of monumental wood panels displayed in public buildings. Both secular and religious. Thos works were by nature perishable. And all of the great panels of the masters are unfortunately lost. Nonetheless, one can get some idea of the polychrome nature of classical panel paintings by studying Greek vases, especially those painted using the white ground technique, which takes its name from the chalky white slip used to provide a background for the painted figures. Experiments with white ground painting date back to the Andokids painter, but the method became popular only toward the middle of the 5th century BCE. Achilles Painter One of the masters of white ground painting was the so-called Achilles Painter, who decorated the Lekithas, Florida asked to hold perfumed oil, in Fig 5-58. White ground is essentially a variation of the red figure technique. First the painter covered the pot with a slip of very effy northeast white clay, then applied black glaze to outline the effigures, and diluted brown purple, red, and white to color them. The artist could use other colors for example. The yellow the Achilles painter chose for the garments of both effigures on this Lekithas but these had to be applied after firing because the Greeks did not know how to make them withstand the heat of the kill. Despite the obvious attractions of the technique, the impermanence of the expanded range of colors discouraged white ground painting on everyday vessels, such as drinking cups and craters. In fact, Greek artists explored the full polychrome possibilities of the white ground technique almost exclusively on Lekithoi, which families commonly placed in graves as offerings to the deceased. For vessels designed for short-term use, the fragile nature of white ground painting was of little concern. The Achilles painter, like the reed painter, Fig 5, 50 AA, later in the century, selected a scene appropriate for the funerary purpose of a Lekithas. A youthful warrior takes leave of his wife. The red scarf, mirror, and jug hanging on the wall behind the woman indicate that the setting is the interior of their home. The motif of the seated woman is strikingly similar to that of Hijiso on her grave steel, fig 5 to 57, but here the woman is the survivor. It is her husband, preparing to go to war with helmet, shield, and spear, who will depart. Never to return. On his shield is a large painted eye, roughly life-size. Greek shields often bore decorative devices such as the horrific face of Medusa, intended to ward off evil spirits and frighten the enemy, compare Fig 5 to 16. Th's eye undoubtedly recalls this tradition, but for the Achilles painter it was little more than an excuse to display superior drawing skills. Since the late 6th century BCE, Greek painters had abandoned the archaic habit of placing frontal eyes on profile faces and attempted to render the eyes in profile. The Achilles painter's mastery of this difficult problem in foreshortening is on exhibit here. Polygnotosthe leading panel painter of the Ferst half of the 5th century BCE was Polygnotos of Thassos, whose works adorned important buildings both in Athens and Delphi. One of these was the Pinakothek of Nasikles Propylaea, but the most famous was a portico in the Athenian marketplace that came to be called the Stoa Poikil, painted Stoa. 
Descriptions of Polignatos's paintings make clear that he introduced a revolutionary compositional format. Before Polignatos, figures stood on a common ground line at the bottom of the picture plane, whether they appeared in horizontal bends or single panels. Polignatos placed his figures on different levels, staggered in tiers in the manner of Asher Bonipal's Lion Hunt Relief, Fig 2 to 23, of two centuries before. He also incorporated landscape elements into his paintings, making his pictures true windows onto the world and not simply surface designs peopled with foreshortened F figures. Polygnatos's abandonment of a single ground line was as momentous a break from the past as early classical Greek sculptor's rejection of frontality in statuary. Niobid Painter Polygnatos's influence is evident on a red figure crater, Fig 5-59 painted around the middle of the 5th century BCE by the Neobid painter so named because one side of this crater depicts the massacre of the Neobids, the children of Niobe. Niobe, who had at least a dozen children, had boasted that she was superior to the goddess Leto, who had only two offspring. Apollo and Artemis To punish her hubris, arrogance, and teach the lesson that no mortal could be superior to a god or goddess, Leto sent her two children to slay all of Niobe's many sons and daughters. On the Neobid painter's crater, the horrible slaughter occurs in a schematic landscape setting of rocks and trees. The painter disposed the figures on several levels, and they actively interact with their setting. One slain son, for example, not only has fallen upon a rocky outcropping but is partially hidden by it. The Neobid painter also drew the sun's face in a three-quarter view, something that even Euphronius and Euthymides had not attempted. Phiale painter further insight into the appearance of monumental panel paintings of the 5th century BCE comes from a white ground crater, Fig 5-60, by the Phiale painter. The subject is Hermes handing over his half-brother, the infant Dionysus. To Paposolinos, Grandpa Satyr. The other figures represent the nymphs in the shady glens of Nyssa, where Zeus had sent Dionysus, one of his numerous natural sons, to be raised, safe from the possible wrath of his wife, Hera. Unlike the decorators of funerary Lekythoi, the Phiol painter used for this crater only colors that could survive the heat of a Greek kill red, brown, purple, and a special snowy white reserved for the flesh of the nymphs and for the hair, beard, and shaggy body of Paposolinos. The use of diluted brown wash to color and shade the rocks may reflection ECT the coloration of Polygnatos's landscapes. Th's vase and the Neobid crater together provide a shadowy idea of the character of Polygnatos's lost paintings. Tomb of the Diver, Pistum Although all of the panel paintings of the masters disappeared long ago, some Greek mural paintings survive. An early example is in the Tomb of the Diver at Pistum. Covering the four walls of this small, coffin-like tomb are banquet scenes of the kind that appear regularly on Greek bases. On the tomb's cover slab, Fig 5-61, a youth dives from a stone platform into a body of water. The scene most likely symbolizes the plunge from this life into the next. Trees resembling those of the Neobid crater are included within the decorative frame. Late Classical Period The Peloponnesian War, which began in 431 BCE, ended in 404 BCE with the complete defeat of a plague-weakened Athens. The victor, Sparta, and then Th. Ebes undertook the leadership of Greece, both unsuccessfully. In the middle of the 4th century BCE, a threat from, from that caused the rival Greek states to put aside their animosities and unite for their common defense, as they had earlier against the Persians. But at the Battle of Cheroni in 338 BCE, the Greek cities suffered a devastating loss and had to relinquish their independence to the Macedonian king, Philip II, r. 359-336 BCE. Philip was assassinated in 336, and his son, Alexander III, r. 336-323 BCE, better known simply as Alexander the Great, succeeded him. Alexander led a powerful army on an extraordinary campaign that overthrew the Persian Empire, the ultimate revenge for the Persian invasion of Greece in the early 5th century, wrested control of Egypt, and even reached India. See Chapter 15. Sculpture. 
The 4th century BCE in Greece was thus a time of political upheaval, which had a profound impact on the psyche of the Greeks and on the art they produced. In the 5th century BCE, Greeks had generally believed that rational human beings could impose order on their environment, create perfect statues such as the canon of Polykolatos, and discover the correct mathematical formulas for constructing temples such as the Parthenon. The Parthenon frieze celebrated the Athenians as a community of citizens with shared values. The Peloponnesian War and the unceasing strife of the 4th century BCE brought an end to the serene idealism of the previous century. Disillusionment and alienation followed. Greek thought and Greek art began to focus more on the individual and on the real world of appearances instead of on the community and the ideal world of perfect beings and perfect buildings. Praxiteles' the new approach to art is immediately apparent in the work of Praxiteles, one of the great masters of the 4th century BCE. Praxiteles did not reject the favored sculptural themes of the high classical period, and his Olympian gods and goddesses retained their superhuman beauty. But in his hands, those deities lost some of their solemn grandeur and took on a worldly sensuousness. Nowhere is this new humanizing spirit plainer than in the statue of Aphrodite, Fig 5-62, that Praxiteles sold to the Nidians after another city had rejected it. The lost original, carved from Parian marble, is known only through copies of Roman date, but Pliny considered it superior to all the works, not only of Praxiteles, but indeed in the whole world. It made Nidus famous and many people sailed there just to see the statue in its round temple, compare Fig 5 to 72, where it was possible to view the image of the goddess from every side. According to Pliny, some visitors were overcome with love for the statue. The Aphrodite of Nidus caused such a sensation in its time because Praxiteles took the unprecedented step of representing the goddess of love completely nude. Female nudity was rare in earlier Greek art and had been confined almost exclusively to paintings on vases designed for household use. The women so depicted also were usually not noble women or goddesses but courtesans or slave girls, like the one one's emos depicted on a red figure drinking cup, Fig 5, 23a. No one had ever dared place inside a temple a statue of a goddess wearing no clothes. Moreover, Praxiteles Aphrodite is not a cold and remote image. In fact, the goddess engages in a trivial act out of everyday life. She has removed her garment, draped it over a large hydria, water pitcher, and is about to step into the bath. Although shocking in its day, the Aphrodite of Nadus is not openly erotic, the goddess modestly shields her pelvis with her right hand, but she is quite sensuous. Lucian, writing in the 2nd century CE, noted that she had a welcoming look and a slight smile and that Praxiteles was renowned for his ability to transform marble into soft and radiant florida esh. Lucian mentioned, for example, the dewy quality of Aphrodite's eyes. Unfortunately, the rather mechanical Roman copies do not capture the quality of Praxiteles' modeling of the stone, but some originals of the period do for example, a female head, Fig 5, 62a, from Chios. The Praxiteline touch is also evident in a statue once thought to be by the hand of the master himself but now generally considered either a copy of the highest quality or an original work by a son or grandson of the master with the same name. The statue of Hermes and the infant Dionysus, Fig 5-63, found in the Temple of Hera at Olympia brings to the realm of monumental statuary the theme the file painter had chosen for a white ground crater, Fig 5-60, a century earlier. Hermes has stopped to rest in a forest on his journey to Nyssa to entrust the upbringing of Dionysus to Paposolinos and the nymphs. Hermes leans on a tree trunk, here it is an integral part of the composition and not a copyist's addition, and his slender body forms a sinuous, shallow S-curve that is the hallmark of many of Praxiteles' statues. He gazes dreamily into space while he dangles a bunch of grapes, now missing, as a temptation for the infant, who is to become the Greek god of the vine. THS is the kind of tender and very human interaction between an adult and a child that one encounters frequently in real life but that had been absent from Greek statuary before the 4th century BCE. THE quality of the carving is superb. The modeling is deliberately smooth and subtle. 
producing soft shadows that follow the planes as they flow almost imperceptibly one into another. All that is missing to give a complete sense of the look of a Praxiteline statue is the original paint, which a specialist, not the sculptor, applied to the statue, compare Fig 5, 63a. The delicacy of the marble facial features stands in sharp contrast to the metallic precision of Polycolatosa's bronze Doraforos, Fig 5 to 40. The high classical sculptor even subjected the spear bearer's locks of hair to the laws of symmetry, and the hair does not violate the skull's perfect curve. The comparison of these two statues reveals the sweeping change in artistic attitude and intent that took place from the Fe Foot Age to the 4th century BCE. In the statues of Praxiteles, the deities of Mount Olympus still possess a beauty mortals can aspire to, although not achieve, but they are no longer aloof. Praxiteles gods have stepped off their pedestals and entered the world of human experience. Skopas in the Archaic period and throughout most of the early and high classical periods, Greek sculptors generally shared common goals, but in the late classical period of the 4th century BCE, distinctive individual styles emerged. The dreamy, beautiful divinities of Praxiteles had enormous appeal, and the master had many followers, Fig 5, 62a. Other sculptors, however, pursued very different interests. One of these was Scopas of Paros, an architect as well as a sculptor, who designed a temple at Tasia. Fragments of the pedimental sculptures remain, Fig 5, 64a and contributed to the decoration of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Mausoleum, Fig 5, 64b, at Halicarnassos, Sea Wonders, Chapter 2, page 49. Although his sculptures reflect the general late classical trend toward the humanization of the Greek gods and heroes, Scopas's hallmark was intense emotionalism. None of his statues survives, but a grave steel, Fig 5 to 64 found near the Ilissos River in Athens exhibits the psychological tension for which the master's works were famous. The Ilissos steel was originally set into an architectural frame similar to that of the earlier Hegiso steel, Fig 5-57. A comparison of the two works is revealing. In the later steel the relief is much higher, with parts of the figures carved fully in the round. The major difference, however, is the pronounced change in mood which reflects Scopas's innovations. The late classical work makes a clear distinction between the living and the dead and depicts overt mourning. The deceased is a young hunter who has the large, deeply set eyes and florida eshy overhanging brows that characterized Scopas's sculpted figures, compare Fig 5, 64a. At his feet a small boy, either his servant or perhaps a younger brother, sobs openly. The hunter's dog also droops its head in sorrow. Beside the youth, an old man, undoubtedly his father, leans on a walking stick and, in a gesture reminiscent of that of the Olympia seer, Fig 5-31, ponders the irony of fate that has taken the life of his powerful son yet preserved him, the father, in his frail old age. Most remarkable of all, the hunter himself looks out at the viewer, inviting sympathy and creating an emotional bridge between the spectator and the artwork that was inconceivable in the art of the high classical period. Lysipposte third great late classical sculptor, Lysippos of Sikyan, won such renown that Alexander the Great selected him to create his Afi-Chale portrait. Alexander could afford to employ the best because the Macedonian kingdom enjoyed vast wealth. King Philip was able to hire the leading thinker of his age, Aristotle, as the young Alexander's tutor. Lysippos introduced a new canon of proportions in which the bodies were more slender than those of Polycolatos and the heads roughly one-eighth the height of the body rather than once a vent. As in the previous century, one of Lysippos's most famous works, a bronze statue of an Apokyomenos, an athlete scraping oil from his body after er exercising, known, as usual, only from Roman copies in marble, Fig 5 to 65, exhibits the new proportions. A comparison with Polycolatosa's Doraforos, Fig 5 to 40, reveals more than a change in physique, however. A nervous energy, lacking in the balanced form of the Doraforos, runs through Lysippos's Apokyomenos. 
The strigil, scraper, is about to reach the end of the right arm. And at any moment the athlete will switch it to the other hand so that he can scrape his left arm. At the same time, he will shift his weight and reverse the positions of his legs. Lysippos also began to break down the dominance of the frontal view in statuary and encouraged the observer to view his athlete from multiple angles. Because Lysippos represented the Apokyomenos with his right arm boldly thrust forward, the figure breaks out of the shallow rectangular box that defined the boundaries of earlier statues. To comprehend the action, the observer must move to the side and view Lysippos' work at a three-quarter angle or in full profile. To grasp the full meaning of another of Lysippos's works, a colossal statue, Fig 5-66, depicting a weary Heracles, the viewer must walk around it. Once again, the original is lost. The most impressive of the surviving statues based on the Lysippan original is nearly twice life-size. It stood in the baths of Caracalla in Rome, where, like the marble copy of Polycolatosus Doraforos, Fig 5-40, from the Roman philestra at Pompeii, Lysippos' muscle-bound Greek hero provided inspiration for Romans who came to the baths to exercise. The Roman sculptor, Glycan of Athens, signed the statue, but did not mention Lysippos. The educated Roman public needed no label to identify the famous work. The exaggerated muscular development of Heracles is poignantly ironic, however. Lysippos depicted the hero as so weary that he must lean on his club for support. Without that prop, Heracles would topple over. Lysippos and other 4th century BCE artists rejected stability and balance as worthy goals for statuary Heracles holds the golden apples of the Hesperides in his right hand behind his back unseen unless the viewer walks around the statue. Lysippos' subject is thus the same as that of the Metope, Fig 5-33, of the early classical temple of Zeus at Olympia, but the 4th century BCE Heracles is no longer serene. Instead of expressing joy, or at least satisfaction, at having completed one of the impossible twelve labors, he is almost dejected. Exhausted by his physical efforts, he can think only of his pain and weariness. Lysippos's portrayal of Heracles in this statue is an eloquent testimony to late classical sculptor's interest in humanizing the Greek gods and heroes. In this respect, despite their divergent styles, Praxiteles, Scopas, and Lysippos followed a common path. Alexander the Great and Macedonian Court Art Alexander the Great's favorite book was the Iliad, and his own life very much resembled an epic saga full of heroic battles, exotic locales, and unceasing drama. Alexander was a man of singular character, an inspired leader with boundless energy and an almost foolhardy courage. He personally led his army into battle on the back of Bucephalus, Fig 5-70, the wild and mighty steed only he could tame and ride. Alexander's portraits ancient sources reveal that Alexander believed only Lysippos had captured his essence in a portrait and thus only he was authorized to sculpt the king's image. Lysippos' most famous portrait of the Macedonian king was a full-length, heroically nude bronze statue of Alexander holding a lance and turning his head toward the sky. According to Plutarch, an epigram inscribed on the base stated the statue depicted Alexander gazing at Zeus and proclaiming, I place the earth under my sway. You, O oh Zeus, keep Olympus. Plutarch also reported that Lysippos's portrait immortalized Alexander's leonine hair and melting glance. The Lysippan original is lost, and because Alexander was portrayed so many times, and long after er his death, it is very difficult to determine which of the many surviving images is most faithful to the 4th century BCE portrait. A leading candidate is a 3rd century BCE marble head, Fig 5-67, from Pella the capital of Macedonia and Alexander's birthplace. It has the sharp turn of the head and thick mane of hair that were key ingredients of Lysippos's portrait. The Pella sculptor's treatment of the features also is consistent with the style of the later 4th century BCE. The deep-set eyes and parted lips recall the manner of Scopas, Fig 5, 64a, and the delicate handling of the Florida Esh brings to mind the faces of Praxiteline statues, Fig 5-63. Although not a copy, 
this head very likely approximates the young king's Afi Chael portrait and provides insight into Alexander's personality as well as Lysippos's art. Pella Mosaic's Alexander's palace has not been excavated. But the sumptuous life of the Macedonian aristocracy is evident from the costly objects found in Macedonian graves and from the abundance of mosaics uncovered in houses at Pella. The Macedonian mosaics are pebble mosaics, see Mosaics, Chapter 8, page 245. The Florida ores consist of small stones of various colors collected from beaches and riverbanks and set into a thick coat of cement. The finest pebble mosaic yet to come to light from the Pella excavations has a stag hunt, fig 5 to 68, as its emblema, central framed panel. Bordered in turn by an intricate Florida oral pattern and a stylized wave motif, not shown in the illustration. The artist signed his work in the same manner as proud Greek vase painters and potters did. Gnosis made it. THS is the earliest mosaicist's signature known, and its prominence in the design undoubtedly attests to the artist's reputation. THE Holmes' owner wanted guests to know that Gnosis himself, not an imitator, had laid this floor. The Pella Stag Hunt, with its light F figures against a dark ground, has much in common with Red Figur painting. In the pebble mosaic, however, thin strips of lead or terracotta define most of the contour lines and some of the interior details. Subtle gradations of yellow, brown, and red, as well as black, white, and grey pebbles, suggest the interior volumes. Gnosis used shading to model the musculature of the hunters, their billowing cloaks, and the animals' bodies. The use of light and dark to suggest volume is rare on Greek painted vases. Although examples do exist. Monumental painters, however, commonly used shading, the Greek term for which was skiographia, literally. Shadow painting. The Greeks attributed the invention of shading to an Athenian painter of the Fe Foot Age century BCE named Apollodoros. Gnosis's emblema, with its sparse landscape setting, probably reflects contemporaneous panel painting. Hades and Persephone excavations at Virginia have provided valuable additional information about Macedonian art and about Greek mural painting. One of the most important finds was a painted tomb with a representation of Hades. Lord of the Underworld, abducting Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, the goddess of grain. The mural, Fig 5 to 69, is remarkable for its intense drama and for the painter's use of foreshortening and shading. Hades holds the terrified seminude Persephone in his left arm and steers his racing chariot with his right as Persephone's garments and hair blow in the wind. The artist depicted the heads of both figures and even the chariot's wheels in three quarter views. The chariot, in fact, seems to be bursting into the viewer's space. Especially noteworthy is the way the painter used short, dark brush strokes to suggest shading on the underside of Hades' right arm, on Persephone's torso, and elsewhere. Although fragmentary, the Virginia mural is a precious document of the almost totally lost art of monumental painting in ancient Greece. Battle of Issus further insight into developments in painting at the time of Alexander comes from a large mosaic, Fig 5-70, that decorated the floor of a room in a lavishly appointed Roman house at Pompeii. The mosaicist employed tessery, cubical pieces of glass or tiny stones cut to the desired size and shape, instead of pebbles, see Mosaics, Chapter 8, page 245. The subject is a great battle between the armies of Alexander the Great and the Achaemenid Persian king Darius III, r. 336-330 BCE, probably the Battle of Issus in southeastern Turkey, when Darius fled in his chariot in humiliating defeat. The mosaic dates to the late 2nd or early Ferst century BCE. Most art historians believe it is a reasonably faithful copy of Battle of Issus, a famous panel painting of about 310 BCE made by Philozenos of Eritrea for King Cassander, one of Alexander's successors. Some scholars have proposed, however, that the Alexander Mosaic, as it is commonly called, is a copy of a painting by one of the few Greek woman artists whose name is known. Helen of Egypt Battle of Issus is notable for the artist's technical mastery of problems that had long fascinated Greek painters. 
Even you Thymides would have marveled at the 4th century BCE painter's depiction of the rearing horse seen in a three-quarter rear view below Darius. The subtle modulation of the horse's rump through shading in browns and yellows is much more accomplished than the comparable attempts at shading in the Pella mosaic, Fig 5-68, or the Virginia mural, Fig 5-69. Other details are even more impressive. The Persian to the right of the rearing horse has fallen to the ground and raises, backward, a dropped Macedonian shield to protect himself from being trampled. Philozenos recorded the reflection of the man's terrified face on the polished surface of the shield. Everywhere in the scene, men, animals, and weapons cast shadows on the ground. Th's interest in the reflection of insubstantial light on a shiny surface, and in the absence of light, shadows stands in sharp contrast to earlier painters' preoccupation with the clear presentation of weighty figures seen against a blank background. Philozenos here truly opened a window into a world filled not only with figures, trees, and sky but also with light. This new, distinctly Greek notion of what a painting should be characterizes most of the history of art in the Western world from the Renaissance on. Most impressive about Battle of Issus, however, is the psychological intensity of the drama unfolding before the viewer's eyes. Alexander, riding Bucephalus, leads his army into battle, recklessly one might say, without even a helmet to protect him. He drives his spear through one of Darius's trusted immortals, who swore to guard the king's life, while the Persian's horse collapses beneath him. The Macedonian king is only a few yards away from Darius, and Alexander directs his gaze at the Persian king, not at the man impaled on his now useless spear. Darius has called for retreat. In fact, his charioteer is already whipping the horses and speeding the king to safety. Before he escapes, Darius looks back at Alexander and in a pathetic gesture reaches out toward his brash foe. But the victory has slipped from his hands. In Pliny's opinion, Philoxenos's painting of the battle between Alexander and Darius was inferior to none. It is easy to see why he reached that conclusion. Architecture In architecture, as in sculpture and painting, the late classical period was a time of innovation and experimentation. Theatre of Epidauros in ancient Greece, actors did not perform plays repeatedly over months or years as they do today. But only during sacred festivals. Greek drama was closely associated with religious rites and was not pure entertainment. In the 5th century BCE, for example, the Athenians staged performances of the tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides during the Dionysus festival in the theatre dedicated to the god on the southern slope of the Acropolis. Yet it is Epidauros, in the Peloponnesus, that boasts the finest theatre, Fig 5-71, in Greece. Constructed shortly after the birth of Alexander, the theatre is still the setting for performances of ancient Greek dramas. The architect was Polykalatos the Younger, possibly a nephew of the famous 5th century BCE sculptor. The precursor of the formal Greek theatre of Earth where actors performed sacred rites, songs, and dances. This circular hard and level surface later became the orchestra of the theatre. Orchestra literally means dancing place. The actors and the chorus performed there and at Epidauros an altar to Dionysus stood at the center of the circle. The spectators sat on a slope overlooking the orchestra the theatron, or place for seeing. When the Greek theater took architectural shape, the builders always situated the auditorium, cavia, Latin for hollow place, cavity, on a hillside. The cavia at Epidauros, composed of wedge-shaped sections, cunia, singular cuneus, of stone benches separated by stairs, is somewhat greater than a semicircle in plan. The auditorium is 387 feet in diameter. And its 55 rows of seats accommodated about 12,000 spectators. They entered the theater via a passageway between the seating area and the scene building, scheme, which housed dressing rooms for the actors and also formed a backdrop for the plays. The design is simple but perfectly suited to its function. Even in antiquity, the Epidauros Theatre was famous for the harmony of its proportions. Although spectators sitting in some of the seats would have had a poor view of the scheme, 
all had unobstructed views of the orchestra. Because of the open-air Kavya's excellent acoustics, everyone could hear the actors and chorus. Corinthian Capital's The Theatre at Epidoros is about 500 yards southeast of the sanctuary of Asclepios, and Polykalatos the Younger worked there as well. He was the architect of the Tholos. The circular shrine that probably housed the sacred snakes of the healing god. That building lies in ruins today, its architectural fragments removed to the local museum, but one can get an approximate idea of its original appearance from the somewhat earlier and partially reconstructed Tholos, Fig 5-72, at Delphi that Theodoros of Phokaya designed. Both Tholoi had an exterior colonnade of Doric columns, but the interior columns had bases and Corinthian capitals, Fig 5-73, Cthe Corinthian capital, above, an invention of the second half of the 5th century BCE. Consistent with the extremely conservative nature of Greek temple design, architects did not readily embrace the Corinthian capital. Until the 2nd century BCE, Greek architects used Corinthian capitals only for the interiors of sacred buildings, as at Delphi and Epidoros. The earliest instance of a Corinthian capital on the exterior of a Greek building is the Karagic Monument of Lysocrates, Fig 5-74, which is not really a building at all. Lysocrates had sponsored a chorus in a theatrical contest in 334 BCE, and after he won, he erected a monument to commemorate his victory. The monument consists of a cylindrical drum resembling a tholos on a square base. Engaged Corinthian columns adorn the drum of Lysocrates' monument, and a huge Corinthian capital sits atop the roof. The freestanding capital once supported the victor's trophy, a bronze tripod. Hellenistic Period Alexander the Great's conquest of the Near East and Egypt ushered in a new cultural age that historians and art historians alike call Hellenistic. The Hellenistic period opened with the death of Alexander in 323 BCE and lasted nearly three centuries, until the double suicide of Queen Cleopatra of Egypt and her Roman consort Mark Antony in 30 BCE after their decisive defeat at the Battle of Actium by Antony's rival Augustus. See page 197. That year, Augustus made Egypt a province of the Roman Empire. The cultural centers of the Hellenistic period were the court cities of the Greek kings who succeeded Alexander and divided his far-flung empire among themselves. Chief among them were Antioch in Syria, Alexandria in Egypt, named after Alexander and the site of his tomb, and Pergamon in Asia Minor, map 5-1. An international culture united the Hellenistic world, and its language was Greek. Hellenistic kings became enormously rich on the spoils of the East, priding themselves on their libraries, art collections, scientific enterprises, and skills as critics and connoisseurs, as well as on the learned men they could assemble at their courts. The world of the small, austere, and heroic city-state passed away, as did the power and prestige of its center, Athens. A cosmopolitan, citizen of the world, in Greek, civilization, much like today's, replaced it. Architecture The greater variety, complexity, and sophistication of Hellenistic culture called for an architecture on an imperial scale and of wide diversity. Something far beyond the requirements of the classical polis. Even beyond that of Athens at the height of its power. Building activity shift ed from the old centers on the Greek mainland to the opulent cities of the Hellenistic monarchs in the east. Temple of Apollo, DIDYMA great scale, a theatrical element of surprise, and a willingness to break the traditional rules of Greek temple design characterize one of the most ambitious projects of the Hellenistic period, the Temple of Apollo, Fig 5-75, at Didyma. The Hellenistic temple replaced the archaic temple at the site the Persians burned in 494 BCE when they sacked nearby Miltos. Construction began in 313 BCE under the direction of two architects native to the area, Paeonius of Ephesos and Daphnis of Miltos. So vast was the undertaking, however, that work on the temple continued off and on for more than 500 years and still the project was never completed. The temple was dipteral in plan and had an unusually broad facade of ten ionic columns almost 65 feet tall. 
the sides had 21 columns. Consistent with the classical formula for perfect proportions used for the Parthenon, 21 equal 2 times 10 plus 1, but nothing else about the design is classical. One anomaly immediately apparent to anyone who approached the building was that it had no pediment and no roof it was hypethral, or open to the sky. Also, the grand doorway to what should have been the temple's cella was nearly five feet off the ground and could not be entered. The explanation for the peculiar elevated doorway is that it served as a kind of stage where the Oracle of Apollo could be announced to those assembled in front of the temple. Further, the unroofed dipteral colonnade did not surround a traditional cella. The columns were instead an elaborate frame for a central courtyard in which was a small pro-style shrine that housed a statue of Apollo. Entrance to the interior court was through two smaller doorways to the left and right of the great portal and down two narrow vaulted tunnels that could accommodate only a single FELE of people. From these dark and mysterious lateral passageways, worshippers emerged into the clear light of the courtyard, which also had a sacred spring and laurel trees in honor of Apollo. Opposite Apollo's inner temple, a stairway some fifty feet wide rose majestically toward three portals leading into the oracular room that also opened onto the front of the temple. This complex spatial planning marked a sharp departure from classical Greek architecture, which stressed a building's exterior almost as a work of sculpture and left its interior relatively undeveloped. HIPPODAMOS of MILETOS When the Greeks finally expelled the Persians from Asia Minor in 479 BCE, they returned to cities in near ruin. Reconstruction of Miltos began after ER 466 BCE. According to a plan laid out by Hippodamos of Miltos, whom Aristotle singled out as the father of rational city planning, Hippodamos imposed a strict grid plan on the site, regardless of the terrain, so that all streets met at right angles. In fact, such orthogonal plans predate Hippodamos not only in archaic Greece and Etruscan Italy but also in the ancient Near East and Egypt. Still, Hippodamos was so famous that his name has ever since been synonymous with this kind of urban plan. The so-called Hippodamian plan also designated separate quarters for public, private, and religious functions. A Hippodamian city was logically as well as regularly planned. This desire to impose order on nature and to assign a proper place in the whole to each of the city's constituent parts was very much in keeping with the philosophical tenets of the F.E. Food Age century BCE. Hippodamos's formula for the ideal city was another manifestation of the same outlook that produced Polykalatos's canon and the Parthenon. Priene Hippodamian planning was still the norm in late classical and Hellenistic Greece. The city of Preen, Fig 5-76 also in Asia Minor, was laid out during the 4th century BCE. It had fewer than 5,000 inhabitants, Hippodamos thought 10,000 was the ideal number. Situated on sloping ground, many of its narrow north-south streets were little more than long stairways. Uniformly sized city blocks, the standard planning unit, were nonetheless imposed on the irregular terrain. More than one unit was reserved for major structures such as the Temple of Athena and the Theatre. The central agora occupied six blocks. Stoa of Attalos, Athens framing each side of Preen's agora was a stoa. THSA covered colonnades, or porticos, which often housed shops and civic offices, were ideal vehicles for shaping urban spaces, and they were staples of Hellenistic cities. Even the agora of Athens, an ancient city notable for its haphazard, unplanned development, was eventually framed to the east and south by stoas placed at right angles to one another. These new porticos joined the famous painted stoa, see page 143, where the Hellenistic philosopher Zeno and his successors taught. The Stoic school of Greek philosophy took its name from that building. Thefe nest of the new Athenian stoas was the stoa of Attalos II. Fig 5 to 77, a gift to the city by a grateful alumnus, the king of Pergamon, R159-138 BCE, who had studied at Athens in his youth. The stoa was meticulously reconstructed under the direction of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens and today has a second life as a museum housing more than seven decades of FENDS from the Athenian Agora, as well as the Office CES of the American Excavation Team.
The Stoa has two stories, each with 21 shops opening onto the colonnade. The facade columns are Doric on the ground level and Ionic on the second story. The mixing of the two orders on a single facade had occurred even in the late classical period. But it became increasingly common in the Hellenistic period, when respect for the old rules of Greek architecture was greatly diminished and a desire for variety and decorative EFFECTs often prevailed. Practical considerations also governed the form of the Stoa of Attalos. The columns are far more widely spaced than in Greek temple architecture, to allow for easy access. Also, the builders left the lower third of every Doric column shaft unflowed to guard against damage from constant traffic. Pergamon Pergamon, the kingdom of Attalos II, was born in the early 3rd century BCE after the breakup of Alexander's empire. Founded by Philateros, R282-263 BCE, the Pergamene kingdom embraced almost all of Western and Southern Asia Minor. Upon the death in 133 BCE of its last king, Attalos III, R138-133 BCE, Pergamon was bequeathed to Rome, which by then was the greatest power in the Mediterranean world. The Attalids enjoyed immense wealth and expended much of it on the embellishment of their capital city, especially its Acropolis. Located there were the Royal Palace, an arsenal and barracks, a great library and theatre, an agora, and the sacred precincts of Athena and Zeus. Altar of Zeus, P-E-R-G-A-M-O-N-T-H-E Altar of Zeus at Pergamon, erected about 175 BCE, is the most famous Hellenistic sculptural ensemble. The Monuments West Front, Fig 5-78, has been reconstructed in Berlin. The altar proper was on an elevated platform, framed by an ionic stoa-like colonnade with projecting wings on either side of a broad central staircase. All around the altar platform was a sculpted frieze almost 400 feet long, populated by about a hundred larger than life-size effigers. The subject is the battle of Zeus and the gods against the giants. It is the most extensive representation Greek artists ever attempted of that epic conflict for control of the world. The Gigantomachy also appeared on the shield of Phidias's Athena Prothenus and on some of the Parthenon metopes, because the Athenians wished to draw a parallel between the defeat of the giants and the defeat of the Persians. In the 3rd century BCE, King Attalos I, R241-197 BCE, had successfully turned back an invasion of the Gauls in Asia Minor. The gigantomachy of the altar of Zeus alluded to that Adelaide victory over those barbarians. The Pergamene designers also used the gigantomachy frieze to establish a connection with Athens, whose earlier defeat of the Persians was by then legendary, and with the Parthenon, which the Hellenistic Greeks already recognized as a classical monument in both senses of the word. The figure of Athena Fig 5 to 79, for example, closely resembles the Athena from the Parthenon's east pediment. While Gaia, the earth goddess and mother of all the giants, emerges from the ground and looks on with horror, Athena grabs the hair of the giant Alcunios as Nike flies in to crown her. Zeus himself, not illustrated, was based on the Poseidon of the west pediment. The Pergamene frieze, however, is not a dry series of borrowed motifs. On the contrary, its tumultuous narrative has an emotional intensity without parallel in earlier sculpture. The battle rages everywhere. Even up and down the steps used to reach Zeus's altar, Fig 5 to 78. Violent movement, swirling draperies, and vivid depictions of death and suffering FELL the freeze. Wounded figures writhe in pain, and their faces reveal their anguish. Deep carving creates dark shadows. THEF figures project from the background like bursts of light. Art historians have justly described these features as Baroque, borrowing the term from 17th century European sculpture, see Chapter 24. Indeed, there perhaps can be no greater contrast than between the Pergamene Gigantomachy frieze and the comparable frieze, Fig 5 to 18, of the archaic Siphonian treasury at Delphi. Dying Gauls on the altar of Zeus, Pergamene sculptors presented the victory of Attalos I over the Gauls in mythological disguise. An earlier Pergamene statuary group explicitly depicted the defeat of the barbarians. 
Roman copies of some of these figures reveal that the Hellenistic sculptors carefully studied and reproduced the distinctive features of the foreign Gauls, most notably their long, bushy hair and mustaches and the torques, neckbands, they frequently wore. The Pergamene victors were apparently not part of this group. The viewer saw only their Gallic foes and their noble and moving response to defeat. In what was probably the centerpiece of the group, a heroic Gallic chief Anne, Fig 5 to 80, defiantly drives a sword into his own chest just below the collarbone, preferring suicide to surrender. He already has taken the life of his wife, who, if captured, would have been sold as a slave. In the best Lysippan tradition, the group can be fully appreciated only by walking around it. From one side, the observer sees the Gaul's intensely expressive face, from another his powerful torso, and from a third the woman's limp, lifeless body. The man's twisting posture, the almost theatrical gestures, and the emotional intensity of the suicidal act are hallmarks of the Pergamene Baroque style and have close parallels in the later frieze of Zeus's altar. The third Gaul from this group is a trumpeter, Fig 5-81, who collapses upon his large oval shield as blood pours from the gash in his chest. He stares at the ground with a pained expression. The Hellenistic Ephigur recalls the dying warrior, Fig 5-28, from the east pediment of the Temple of Aphia at Aegina, but the pathos and drama of the suffering Gaul are far more pronounced. As in the suicide group and the gigantomachy frieze, the sculptor rendered the male musculature in an exaggerated manner. Note the tautness of the chest and the bulging veins of the left leg implying that the unseen Pergamene warrior who has struck down this noble and savage foe must have been an extraordinarily powerful man. If this figure is the Tobison, Trumpeter, Pliny mentioned as the work of the Pergamene master Epigonos, then Epigonos may be the sculptor of the entire group and the creator of the dynamic Hellenistic Baroque style. Sculpture in different ways, Praxiteles, Scopas, and Lysippos had already taken bold steps in redefining the nature of Greek statuary. Still, Hellenistic sculptors went further, both in terms of style and in expanding the range of subjects considered suitable for monumental sculpture. Nike of Samothrace One of the masterpieces of Hellenistic Baroque sculpture is the statue of winged victory set up in the sanctuary of the great gods on the island of Samothrace. The Nike of Samothrace, Fig 5-82, has just alighted on the prow of a Greek warship. She raises her, missing, right arm to crown the naval victor, just as Nike places a wreath on Athena's head on the altar of Zeus, Fig 5-79. But the Pergamene relief figure seems calm by comparison. The Samothracian Nike's wings still beat, and the wind sweeps her drapery. Her hemadion bunches in thick folds around her right leg, and her chitin is pulled tightly across her abdomen and left leg. The statue's setting amplify ed this theatrical effect. The sculptor set the war galley in the upper basin of a two-tiered fountain. In the lower basin were large boulders. The fountain's flowing water created the illusion of rushing waves hitting the prow of the ship. The statue's reflection action in the shimmering water below accentuated the sense of lightness and movement. The sound of splashing water added an oral dimension to the visual drama. Art and nature combined here to create one of the most successful sculptures ever fashioned. In the Nike of Samothrace and other works in the Hellenistic Baroque manner, sculptors resoundingly rejected the polycolatan conception of a statue as an ideally proportioned, self-contained entity on a bare pedestal. The Hellenistic statues interact with their environment and appear as living, breathing, and intensely emotive human, or divine, presences. Venus de Milo in the Hellenistic period, sculptors regularly followed Praxiteles' lead in undressing Aphrodite, but they also openly explored the eroticism of the nude female form. The famous Venus de Milo, Fig 5-83, is a larger-than-life-size marble statue of Aphrodite found on Melos together with its inscribed base, now lost, signed by the sculptor Alexandros of Antioch on Meander. In this statue, the goddess of love is more modestly draped than the Aphrodite of Nidus, Fig 5-62, but is more overtly sexual. Her left hand, separately preserved, 
holds the apple Paris awarded her when he judged her the most beautiful goddess. Her right hand may have lightly grasped the edge of her drapery near the left hip in a half-hearted attempt to keep it from slipping farther down her body. The sculptor intentionally designed the work to tease the spectator, instilling this partially draped Aphrodite with a sexuality absent from Praxiteles' entirely nude image of the goddess. Other Hellenistic sculptors, Fig 5, 83a, especially when creating works for private patrons, went even further in depicting the goddess of love as an object of sexual desire. Barbrini Fawn archaic statues smile at the viewer, and even when classical statues look away, they are always awake and alert. Hellenistic sculptors often portrayed sleep. The suspension of consciousness and the entrance into the fantasy world of dreams the antithesis of the classical ideals of rationality and discipline had great appeal for them. Th's newfound interest is evident in a marble statue, Fig 5-84, of a drunken, restlessly sleeping satyr, a semi-human follower of Dionysus, known as the Barbrini Fawn. Aft er Cardinal Barbrini, who acquired the statue when it was unearthed in Rome in the 17th century. Barbrini hired Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the great Italian Baroque sculptor, figs 24-6-24-8, to restore the statue. Bernini no doubt felt that this dynamic statue in the Pergamene manner was the work of a kindred spirit. The satyr has consumed too much wine and has thrown down his panther skin on a convenient rock, then fallen into a disturbed, intoxicated sleep. His brows are furrowed, and one can almost hear him snore. Eroticism also comes to the fore in this statue. Although men had been represented naked in Greek art for hundreds of years, archaic Kuroi and classical athletes and gods do not exude sexuality. Sensuality surfaced in the works of Praxiteles and his followers in the 4th century BCE. But the dreamy and supremely beautiful Hermes playfully dangling grapes before the infant Dionysus, Fig 5-63, has nothing of the blatant sexuality of the Barbrini Fawn, whose wantonly spread legs focus attention on his genitals. Homosexuality was common in the male world of ancient Greece. It is not surprising that when Hellenistic sculptors began to explore the sexuality of the human body, they turned their attention to both men and women. Sleeping Eros Another Hellenistic depiction of sleep, but one radically different in character, is the bronze statue, Fig 5-85, from Rhodes portraying Eros sleeping on a rock. Before the Hellenistic age, artists usually represented the winged child god of love as an adolescent, Fig 5-50, center. Here, as in the group of Aphrodite, Eros, and Pan, Fig 5-83a, he is the pudgy winged infant Cupid, the form he takes in art from this point up to the present. The Hellenistic representations of Eros are noteworthy because throughout history, artists frequently painted and sculpted babies as miniature adults often with adult personalities to match their mature bodies. Hellenistic sculptors were masters at reproducing the soft flesh and muscles of infants and portraying the spirit of young children in memorable statues. Th's representation of Eros differs from the contemporaneous group from Delos in one important respect. The winged child does not participate in any action. Rather, like the Barbrini Fawn, Fig 5-84, he is asleep, one wing folded beneath him, one foot barely touching the ground, his right arm hanging limply, and his mouth open as he breathes. Eros enjoys the peaceful sleep of an infant free of the worries of the world. Defeated boxer Although Hellenistic sculptors tackled an expanded range of subjects, they did not abandon such traditional themes as the Greek athlete. Nevertheless, they often treated the old subjects in novel ways. Th's is certainly true of the magnificent bronze statue, Fig 5-86, of a seated boxer, a Hellenistic original found in Rome and perhaps at one time part of a group. The boxer is not a victorious young athlete with a perfect face and body but a heavily battered defeated veteran whose upward gaze may have been directed at the man who had just beaten him. Too many punches from powerful hands wrapped in leather thongs Greek boxers did not use the modern sports cushioned gloves have distorted the boxer's face. His nose is broken, as are his teeth. He has smashed colorful our ears. Inlaid copper blood drips from the cuts on his forehead. Nose, 
and cheeks. How different is this rendition of a powerful bearded man from that of the noble Rias warrior, figs 5 to 35 and I, 17, of the early classical period. The Hellenistic sculptor appealed not to the intellect but to the emotions when striving to evoke compassion for the pounded hulk of a once mighty fighter. Old market woman the realistic bent of much Hellenistic sculpture the very opposite of the classical period's idealism is evident above all in a series of statues of old men and women from the lowest rungs of the social order. Shepherds, fishermen, and drunken beggars are common the kinds of people pictured earlier on red figure vases but never before thought worthy of monumental statuary. One of the Effie Nest preserved statues of this type depicts a haggard old woman, fig 5-87 bringing chickens and a basket of fruits and vegetables to sell in the market. Her face is wrinkled, her body bent with age, and her spirit broken by a lifetime of poverty. She carries on because she must, not because she derives any pleasure from life. No one knows the purpose of these statues, but they attest to an interest in social realism absent in earlier Greek statuary. Statues of the aged and the ugly are, of course, the polar opposites of the images of the young and the beautiful that dominated Greek art until the Hellenistic age, but they are consistent with the period's changed character. The Hellenistic world was a cosmopolitan place, and the highborn could not help but encounter the poor and a growing number of foreigners, non-Greek barbarians, on a daily basis. Hellenistic art reflection ECTs this different social climate in the depiction of a much wider variety of physical types including different ethnicities. The sensitive portrayal of Gallic warriors with their shaggy hair, strange mustaches, and golden torques, figs 5-80 and 5-81, has already been noted. Africans, Scythians, and others, formerly only the occasional subject of vase painters, also entered the realm of monumental sculpture in Hellenistic art. Demosthenes' THSA sculptures of foreigners and the urban poor, however realistic, are not portraits. Rather, they are sensitive studies of physical types. But the growing interest in the individual beginning in the late classical period did lead in the Hellenistic era to the production of true likenesses of specific persons. In fact, one of the great achievements of Hellenistic artists was the redefinition of portraiture. In the classical period, K.R. Zyla's won fame for having made the noble Pericles appear even nobler in his portrait, Fig 5-41. In contrast, in Hellenistic times, sculptors sought not only to record the true appearance of their subjects in bronze and stone but also to capture the essence of their personalities in likenesses both accurate and moving. One of the earliest of these, perhaps the finest of the Hellenistic age and frequently copied in Roman times, was a bronze portrait statue of Demosthenes, Fig 5-88, by Polyoctos. The original, commissioned in 280 BCE, 42 years after E.R. the great orator's death, stood in the Athenian Agora. Demosthenes was a frail man and in his youth even suffered from a speech impediment, but he had enormous courage and great moral conviction. A veteran of the disastrous battle against Philip II at Cheroni, he repeatedly tried to rally opposition to Macedonian imperialism, both before and after Alexander's death. In the end, when it was clear the Macedonians would capture him, he took his own life by drinking poison. Polyoctos rejected Chrysalis's and Lysippos's notions of the purpose of portraiture and did not attempt to portray a supremely confident leader with a magnificent physique. His Demosthenes has an aged and slightly stooped body. The orator clasps his hands nervously in front of him as he looks downward, deep in thought. His face is lined, his hair is receding, and his expression is one of great sadness. Whatever physical discomfort Demosthenes felt is here joined by an inner pain, his deep sorrow over the tragic demise of democracy at the hands of the Macedonian conquerors. Hellenistic art under Roman patronage in the opening years of the 2nd century BCE the Roman general Flamininus defeated the Macedonian army and declared the old polis of classical Greece free once again. The city-states never regained their former glory, however. Greece became a Roman province in 146 BCE. When Athens 60 years later sided with King Mithridates VI of Pontus, R1263 BCE, 
in his war against Rome, the general Sulla crushed the Athenians. Th. Ariafter, although Athens retained some of its earlier prestige as a center of culture and learning. Politically it was merely another city in the ever-expanding Roman Empire. Nonetheless, Greek artists continued to be in great demand, both to furnish the Romans with an endless stream of copies of classical and Hellenistic masterpieces and to create new statues in Greek style for Roman patrons. Laoco on one work of this type is the famous group, Fig 5-89, of the Trojan priest Laocoon and his sons, unearthed in Rome in 1506 in the presence of the great Italian Renaissance artist Michelangelo, see Chapter 22. The marble group, long believed an original of the 2nd century BCE, was found in the remains of the palace of the Emperor Titus, R7981 CE exactly where Pliny had seen it more than 14 centuries before. Pliny attributed the statue to three sculptors Athenaderos, Page Sandros, and Polydoros of Rhodes who art historians now generally think worked in the early Ferst century CE. THSA artists probably based their group on a Hellenistic masterpiece depicting Laocoon and only one son. Their variation on the original added the son at Laocoon's left, Note the greater compositional integration of the other two F figures, to conform with the Roman poet Virgil's account in the Aeneid. Virgil vividly described the strangling of Laocoon and his two sons by sea serpents while sacrificing at an altar. The gods who favored the Greeks in the war against Troy had sent the serpents to punish Laocoon, who had tried to warn his compatriots about the danger of bringing the Greeks' wooden horse within the walls of their city. In Virgil's graphic account, Laocoon suffered in terrible agony. Athenaderos and his colleagues communicated the torment of the priest and his sons in spectacular fashion in the marble group. The three Trojans writhe in pain as they struggle to free themselves from the death grip of the serpents. One bites into Laocoon's left hip as the priest lets out a ferocious cry. The serpent entwined figures recall the suffering giants of the great frieze of the altar of Zeus at Pergamon and Laocoon himself is strikingly similar to Alcyonios, Fig 5-79, Athena's opponent. In fact, many scholars 5-89 Athenaderos, Hage Sandros, and Polydoros of Rhodes, Laocoon and his sons, from Rome, Italy, early 1st century CE. Marble, 7-100-1-2 high. Musée Vaticani, Rome. Hellenistic style lived on in Rome. Although stylistically akin to Pergamene sculpture, this statue of sea serpents attacking Laocoon and his two sons matches the account given only in the Aeneid. 5-90 Athenaderos, Hage Sandros, and Polydoros of Rhodes. Head of Odysseus, from the villa of Tiberius, Sperlonga, Italy, early 1st century CE. Marble, 211-4 high. Museo Archeologico, Sperlonga. This emotionally charged depiction of Odysseus was part of a mythological statuary group the three Laocoon sculptors made for a grotto at the Emperor Tiberius's seaside villa at Sperlonga. Believe that a Pergamene statuary group of the 2nd century BCE was the inspiration for the three Rhodian sculptors. Sperlongath at the work seen by Pliny was made for Romans rather than Greeks was confirmed in 1957 by the discovery of fragments of several Hellenistic style groups illustrating scenes from Homer's Odyssey. Archaeologists found the sculptures in a grotto that served as the summer banquet hall of the seaside villa of the Roman Emperor Tiberius, R1437 CE, at Sperlonga. One of these groups depicting the monster Scylla attacking Odysseus's ship bears the signatures of the same three sculptors Pliny cited as the creators of the Laocoon group. Another group, installed around a central pool in the grotto, depicted the blinding of the Cyclops Polypemas by Odysseus and his comrades, an incident also set in a cave in the Homeric epic. The figure of Odysseus, Fig 5-90 from this theatrical group is one of the Effie Nest sculptures of antiquity. The hero's cap can barely contain his swirling locks of hair. Even Odysseus's beard seems to be swept up in the emotional intensity of the moment. The parted lips and the deep shadows produced by sharp undercutting add drama to the head, which complemented Odysseus's agitated body. 
The Baroque school of Hellenistic sculpture thus lived on long after Greece ceased to be a political force. When Rome inherited the Pergamene kingdom from the last of the Attalids in 133 BCE, it also became heir to the Greek artistic legacy. What Rome adopted from Greece it passed on to the medieval and modern worlds. If Greece was peculiarly the inventor of the European spirit, Rome, see Chapter 7, was its propagator and amplifier.